<laughs> Astonishing Legends would like to thank our contributors at Patreon for helping to make tonight's commercial-free bonus show possible. Help me. When the Astonishing Legends team set off for Atchison, Kansas in July of 2018, we were excited about attending the annual Amelia Earhart Festival there in her hometown and also being a part of a prestigious panel on her life and disappearance. The trip had a lot of fun events planned. Among other things, it would be the first time we were meeting Tess Feifel in person, our head of research for the past three years. We of course knew that there was an infamous haunted house in Atchison. We had every intention of doing a show on it while we were there, but we'd become overwhelmed with our other duties and eventually decided that we would try to get to the house if we could and put a show together on it later, but if that didn't happen, we wouldn't beat ourselves up. After all, we had a lot on our plates. The Sally House had other plans for us, however. We've come to believe it wasn't going to let us leave town without having our team over for a visit. Maybe it's a stretch to say that something in that house manipulated events and pulled us in. We can never know that for sure, but what we do know is that my co-host Scott now feels inexplicably drawn back to it, and that was after having an experience there that no one would want to repeat. Tonight, we will take you along with us on the journey that led us to the Sally House and share with you the events that unfolded through not only our eyes, but the eyes of those that went with us. Scott wanted me to warn you though. He feels that we must consider the possibility that whatever we encountered in that house knew what it was doing when it presented itself to us, and that it couldn't think of a better way to draw more people in for a visit. All we know is that if you go there seeking proof of something frightening and unseen at the Sally House, you're quite likely to get it, or maybe it's likely to get you. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Forrest Burgess, and this is Scott Philbrook. We have seen the Sally House, and it has seen us. Welcome to part two of our series on the Sally House of Atchison, Kansas. A couple of quick things to point out before we get into tonight's show. The first thing we wanted to say is thank you to all of our listeners. We're so fortunate to have you guys, and it's our pleasure to give back to you by presenting tonight's Halloween special commercial-free for you guys. Yes, thank you so much for helping us come this far. We always feel like it's an honor to do our best to entertain you year-round. And on that note, we wanted to tell you about another podcast, a couple of fellow podcasters like us that we've become friends with, Adam and Matt, over the Graveyard Tales. And they do a fantastic job, we think. Just good research, more digestible, <laughs> shall we say, <laughs> than... We are than the uh, the bloated meals we put out. But they have a really good rapport, and I love their voices. There's this down-home Southern charm about it. That's the vibe that Scott and I always try and go for. Just, you're sitting around with us discussing this, the topics that we love, but with good notes. And they got that in spades, just that kind of charm. And you really feel welcomed into their conversation. Just search for Graveyard Tales wherever you get your podcasts or online and you'll find them. Yeah, it's a great show. And like Forrest said, they have a great rapport and it's the kind of topics that we cover too. So if you like us, you're going to like them. So go check them out. I did want to say, you know, we had a fair amount of shows with warnings this October and this one has to have one too. The only problem is I'm, you know, I wrote this out, but I, I'm not really sure how to word tonight's warning. If you wind up listening to all of tonight's episode, you're going to hear a recording of an EVP or electronic voice phenomenon that is, for me anyway, extremely hard to listen to. Now, Forrest has told me that it's not as difficult for him and perhaps others because it's less personal for him and maybe other folks. So maybe it's just me that has a hard time listening to it. I can't really say what your perception is going to be as a listener, but we are playing it in its entirety in tonight's show. I really can't begin to imagine how it might affect different people, but for me personally, my nine-year-old son, who was with us the day we captured it, 
doesn't even know it exists. And I have no intention of playing it for him for years because I find it incredibly chilling. And hearing it upsets me so much that I find myself going into a dissociative state whenever I listen to it. And now I can't unhear it. It's always there. Also, whatever you think it might be saying, and we're not sure, to me it is without a doubt a representation of absolute rage. At least it sounds like that. So if you're triggered by aggressive, condescending verbal abuse, or you're particularly sensitive to dark spiritual energy, I would encourage you to skip listening to the recording itself. We're going to provide a warning before it starts playing, so you can skip over it if you want. Consider yourself warned, and this is not a play for drama, folks. I'm serious about this. This recording is, is not sound design or special effects, so recognize that if you find yourself believing an unseen dark spiritual entity created it, as I do, you're then going to be left having to reconcile that things like that actually exist, as I've been trying to reconcile for three months now. To be abundantly clear and say it again, I would not play the end of this show for young children. For those of you that will hear it and think nothing of it, I envy you. After part three of this series, I will likely never listen to it again. All right. Well, let's get into this episode. As you may remember from our episode of two days ago, we've broken the story into chapters. In our last show, we covered chapters one through three. That consisted of chapter one being The Legend of Sally, chapter two being the timeline, and chapter three being our interview with the Pickmans who suffered greatly at the Sally House in the early 1990s, as well as our interviews with Maria Miller and the current owner of the house, Les Smith. We'll get to the next chapter in a minute, but we did want to take a second to set the stage for what might actually be haunting the Sally House besides just Sally. So let's talk about that a minute, because it helps to frame the experience we had when we were over there. Yeah, so we need to frame what people think might be in there because I think we've made it pretty clear and I think the interviews in part one make it clear that there may be something more going on there than just this little girl and this apocryphal story about the surgery and dying because that story doesn't seem to really add up. Well, we found some Sally's, there's some Sally's, but then there's one Sally is an older lady that had a bunch of kids and then another Sally is... Well, you know, it's it's something that you said earlier that makes it interesting is that There are some strange things that line up that are hard to dismiss. The name Sally itself keeps coming up from different people independently. Now, is that something there? Is that a consciousness, you could say? Is it something like the article you sent me a few days ago about the Boltzmann brain? Oh, yeah. A disembodied consciousness. Yeah. That's an interesting twist on this. What if it's an angry, disembodied consciousness? Or it just sounds angry, but it's like a child who doesn't know how to use its words. I just don't think that what we got on our recording is a little girl. Well, at all. No, but the, see, actually, I know it isn't. I can well, say that I know that it isn't. <laughs> to you personally. No, I, it's not. I just know that it's not a little girl. Well, that's what I'm saying, Scott. But to everyone else, that's like me saying, I know what happened. Well, how do you know? Don't tell me what happened. That's what I'm saying. That's my, been my argument since we started the show. Right. You have your own solid feelings, and that's valid for you. It's not wrong for you. But to the rest of us, and especially to the skeptics and debunkers, I need more than that before I'm going to believe what you think, even if you tell me it's like it's, it's not deep a child, down. though. It's not a child. Well, there's been a lot of different things. Now, if you listen to Tony Pickman, remember, he said he could hear children laughing and yeah, giggling. I agree that that's what in is there. there. That's is that not children? what's on our recording. No, that it, is not it, children it, laughing it, and giggling. <laughs> and it's nothing even closely related well, to it, in my opinion. Uh, let me ask you this, though, because this is my feeling, and, and we're not going to go analyze it right now. What this section is about that we're about to talk about, what the purpose of this is, is that as we've gone through, as I've gone through all this material, I try to find where there's been some kind of conclusion discussed. Because again, as humans, that's what we want. We want an answer for the what need is this? for cognitive closure. You want something rather than just saying like, I don't know. There's a lot of people out there I, that I know of personally that would be like, I don't care. I don't need to know what that is. To me, that's nothing. It's a weird sound. I can't tell you what it is, but good luck. I'm not going to believe what you tell me either, because I don't believe that any of this stuff. Yeah. And that's fine. You were entitled to that. But to the people who, like us, who are curious about this kind of thing and who want to know, and I'd say not be obsessed with it, but just have a healthy curiosity about it and are not shying away from it, you want to draw a conclusion based on what you found. And it's like the academics we've met who are adventurous enough to study this in the first place when many won't. I don't care what this thing is. And I'm just saying this for me, the personal part of this experience for me. Right. 
is whatever's on our recording, I don't care what it is. I don't need to know. You know, I started out with our show trying to figure out, I wanted to see proof of things that were paranormal. Well, we're, we're yeah. And now yeah. that, you know, something has happened and other people might not consider it proof, but let me tell you what, we've done a fair amount of investigation on this. And, you know, tonight we're just, you're going to hear the recording in this episode. The show that we're coming back with after this will be a talk with one of the premier forensic audiologists in the country about what he thinks it is. So we're going that science route, and we want everybody to know that in the Well, long as run. much as you can apply to this. As because, much as you can apply to because it. Because I would say that there are many people in the scientific field who would think all of this is silly. Right. Well, then so, that's fine for them. I guess I'm yeah. just trying to tell you that I don't have a need for cognitive closure here. Yeah. I don't need to know what that thing is. I do not believe that it is a child. The recording. Yeah, right. But I believe that Sally, of course, maybe, you know, maybe I shouldn't say of course, but I do. I personally believe everything that Tony and Deborah experienced. And in all our research, I think that there was something there and there was a child. My question is, with regard to that child spirit, and this is sort of what we're talking about a little mm -hmm. bit now, you know, what's there, what is it? Is that an additional spirit or is it a mask? Is it something worse, like what we well, recorded, yes. pretending to be a little girl? Right. So, but then this counters your own statement a minute ago. Well, you and I are going to talk about this later on. We're not dropping this. What I'm saying right now is you might be countering your own statement because you're like, I don't want to know what this is. But you kind of do. No, I don't. All right, let me ask you this then. What question do you want answered? I want to be done with this show and I don't want to think about this thing anymore and but, I don't ever want to hear it again. Okay. I want to well, be done with it. Me, I don't care what it is. Yeah. Well, let me, all right, let me ask you this then because as your friend and uh, podcast partner here, we're in this together. If you had told me I don't want to do a show about this at all, I don't care to think about this, this scares the crap out of me, I can't explain it, but it disturbs me so greatly we're not going to do a show on this. So what are we doing here? I seriously weighed that multiple times, more times than I can count, actually. And I think the only reason I didn't push it is because it's Halloween and <laughs> we need to do our shows. The yeah, show must go on. Right. You know, since you're saying this, this is something I did want to talk about. And we're going to be a little bit all over the place, I guess, with this, because if something comes to my mind, I'm going to go ahead and say it, because this was a very personal experience for me. I've had a hard time just even marketing this series mm -hmm. because, you know, I do all our social media, a lot of it anyway, except for Patreon, which Tess manages, you know, it's up to me to be like, Hey, this is coming up, you know, and we, we had John, our friend, John, who does the opening announce, you know, make that fun. You heard it tonight, another kind of fun, spooky thing. And it's like, that's cool, but it feels weird to me to put that on this. And for this series, if we had been way out ahead, I would have had a serious sit down with you about just leaving this alone. That's yeah. the God's honest truth. Yeah. And I didn't do that because we've sold ads. We well, want to entertain people. Well, we, we couldn't come up with something on short notice. We would have been in an incredibly stressful position in terms of content production. And to me, running this was the lesser of two evils. Well, look, again, as I said, as your friend, if you said, I don't want to do this, then we're not doing it. I know I mean, you we, would have done and, that. And, and, I want you to know I know you yeah, would have course, done that, and I course. appreciate that, and that's why we're such good partners. Of course. But I didn't want to do that. But right. I definitely laid in bed thinking about it more than a few nights. Yeah. Okay, so you've answered the question. We're doing this because you, you felt an obligation just as a show and as a producer. Yeah, and we were we were out of the gate. Once something's in the pipeline, it's like you can't stop it. <laughs> well, you know? I mean, we we went I mean, there. we couldn't have without. Yeah. Just, well, you know, we, we would have we would have done other topics. That's yeah. my point. Of course, but it's Halloween. I want to do something you know good. Well, and that's... like what's better than going on a ghost hunt and getting this crazy recording? You know? Yeah, but you know what? Once that happened, I was like, it wasn't what I expected. I guess no. But when we went there, that's kind of what we set up the beginning of the show here in our cold open is that this was not what we expected at all. Yeah. You know, we expected a nice quaint <laughs> tour through. It's probably more like the McIntyre Villa there, which is yes. like, you know, also antique, haunted, also haunted, but more gently and genteely, yes. like, you know, nice antique furniture, nicely restored. Yes. That's kind of in my mind's eye what it was going to be like, but we did not know what to expect. And so at that point, though, we were not obligated to do anything. Yeah. Other than go to the Amelia Earhart Festival and try not to sound like idiots that yeah. was really the, our big goal there and, and contribute and this was a side thing that had its own adventure that we did not choose you could put it that way 
so to get back to this though, you're kind of on board, but you're all kind of not on board. I mean, it's it was a story dumped in our laps, and you yeah. can always choose to do it or not. But I want to do a good show for the audience, of course, yeah, you know, yeah, for our listeners. And I think it's an interesting topic, and I think the recording is compelling. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to sharing it with them and seeing what everybody thinks. And like you said, some people will dig it, some others will be like, I don't know what that is. What it's nothing. Yeah. But I guess the only thing I want to say about that, and I don't want to get us too far off track right now is that the recording is just the recording. It doesn't take into account the actual really visceral personal experience I had at the moment that I heard it in the house. Yeah. And then a whole trail of other events that have happened since we got back. Yeah, that's but, kind of hard to can or bottle. Yeah. You, you don't get that experience. And you can't and explain it. And, and that's, yeah. I've said that so many times, not in defense of people's experiences, but just to maybe put that in the minds of people that outright that's fine. You can dismiss it. But I, as far as insulting people that have had these kinds of experiences of being kooks and crackpots, I can tell you right now, my good friend Scott here is neither of those. He's is a sober individual, spiritually and mentally, as you'll ever come across, and somebody I would wholeheartedly and do trust implicitly with his observations. But I know that they are his own. So in light of the other question posed, not wanting to know what this thing is. Did I just ask you that? Is well, it, it's not that I don't want to know. It, I'm interested in exploring it. And if there's an answer, that would be fascinating and right. interesting to me. But I also am okay not knowing. In light of that. I, and I don't feel compelled to seek the solution. Right. For you, that's not the important part of this story because right. I think you call that the red herring or the MacGuffin. It's the glowing thing in the suitcase. In Pulp Fiction. In Pulp Fiction. Yeah. What is it? Well, Tarantino knows it doesn't matter what it is. It's weird. It's, it shouldn't be glowing gold, but it drives the impetus for these characters to do what they're doing. It provides purpose. And in this story of us here in this place, I have a different view of it because, of course, that's where my curiosity takes me. And I did not experience the things that you did. So I would like to know exactly what that is defined, being-wise, entity-wise. But I understand when you tell me, you don't need to know because you tell me if I'm right. Here's what I see as the important part of this is that as your friend, I've seen you change dramatically, really open up into this new spiritual direction in a way that was, I wouldn't say not always there or just not present. It just hadn't been awakened yet. And this thing, this little bit of audio, did that. That was accompanied also by a feeling that was there. Again, it's not just the weird audio, like, oh my God, he freaked out when he heard something strange on a tape that he couldn't explain. With that comes a visceral feeling, and it's the gestalt of all that, the sum of all that, being the greater than the elements of that, having this effect on you. And that's the story. Now, does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I, I think the only thing I want to say in response to you is, had you had an experience that I hadn't necessarily been a part of, and this hadn't happened to me, and I was still the person I was before it happened, then I would be dying to know what you encountered. Okay, that's good. So if the yeah. tables were turned. Yeah. So the tables being turned, you would want to know what is this entity? Right, because you're in this different category. And you know what's interesting? And, and I... I we're yeah, in a place, do it. so I got to say do it, it now, man. Yeah. regardless of where we are. <laughs> Let it rip. What it reminds me of is that switch that flips when you become a parent. Mm. And suddenly every movie, everything you see, and there's a little kid, your whole perception of how you take that in is just completely different. Right. And just really different. It's hard to watch bad things happen to kids yeah, yeah. in movies, even like minor bad things, because you can't help but think about your own kid and them being in that position and how that would break your heart or does break your heart. Yeah. So it becomes much, much harder. And it's the same kind of switch. It's like this emotional switch that has yeah. been flipped for me that it's like, oh, I got to know more about this. I want proof. I want to, you know, it's like you, that your expression and ghost in a jar, we're going to take it. We're going to prove that this stuff exists and that it's happening. And now for me personally, this particular experience is proof for me. Mm -hmm. I don't care at all if anyone else believes it. Yeah. I don't care if people hear it and they think it's some old men playing poker, you know, whatever <laughs> right, it is. Right. But you now have the attitude of people that have lived with this of the Pickmans, Deborah and Tony, and of Carol, a Pontifract. Yes. And of anybody else who's gone through this and has dealt with this and has not turned away, that is exactly their attitude. It's like maybe Travis Walton. It's like, yeah, I get the ridicule all the time. 
I'm beyond that. I don't care what you think anymore. Here's my thing with me personally. It's like, I don't care if you don't believe me, but I want you to have the facts straight, at least. I want you to understand what I'm saying and then make an assessment on the real facts or the, my real presentation and go from there, but not assume things about me that are incorrect. I'm grateful to have the recording because I can present that to people yeah. and say, this is part of what happened to me. And by right. the way, it's only part of it. Right. And that's great. But if I didn't have the recording at all, I would be in the position that I think a lot of paranormal investigators find themselves in or whatever that where they witness something and yeah. it didn't get recorded. The batteries went dead. Like even Chuck Sikowski was talking about all the batteries were dead. You know, everything he took out of his mm -hmm. truck that day. Mm hmm. And I had nothing to show for this experience. I would feel a little more naked about it. Yeah. But on the other hand, also having the recording, not having the recording, the exact moment, the thing that happened is so ingrained and a part of me now. Yeah. And like I said, it just doesn't matter to me. It right. doesn't even matter if nobody hears a recording. So it's, right. it's kind of like, I'm not putting the recording out because I need to be validated by our listeners or invalidated by people that don't think... You know, I'm putting it out because this is what we do. We make a show yeah. and it's about this kind of stuff. And this yeah. is, a, I think, a pretty interesting example of this kind of stuff. But right. I'm not doing it because I need people to tell me anything about it. No, because that's speaking from the personal point of view. And then the other part, the recording itself, well, that comes from the take and the methodology of the paranormal investigator. That's a good piece of evidence he got right there. And that was kind of my first thought when I first heard it. It's like, wow, this is something. Yeah. I, it, this is not interference. Again, you, you want to know my visceral thing. It's like, there's something here. We got something. It was something that you got specifically. I went back in there and uh, got a different result. And to your earlier analogy, I think it's a good one because I can express my feeling as kind of the outsider here, being there, but not feeling it as deeply as you did. It's like being a parent. Like, I'm not a parent. You know, of course, people who don't have kids, we hear this from parents all the time. Like, you just don't know, man. No, I know. You, and I you, never you... say that because it's no. so, like, rude. Well, I, But it's... by the same token, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to convey the feeling. No, I, yeah. I get it. But yeah. it's a clumsy way of saying, I'm experiencing a feeling that you can't. It's like, look, I'm not stupid. I know that. I think when people take umbrage, when that's heard, it's like... I'm not an uncaring beast. I, of course, care about humans and their well-being, and especially children. I can empathize with that. I have the capacity for empathy. I can feel that. What I can tell you, though, and that you're not expressing, or the, or the person who's saying that, it's like, yes, I also realize that I can't feel that, what you are feeling, and that's that deep emotional switch being flipped once you have the kid. And, and I, I realize all those aspects of that. You know, so I guess applied to this situation, it's... I'm right there with you, man. But also, I know that I did not feel what you did. Yeah. But I believe you. It's like I have the empathy. The only thing that's missing, and again, I can hear the evidence. I'm glad that's why we have that, because that makes a connection to me that, again, it's not like I would disbelieve you because I know you. But it, to me, that's a glimpse into something that's unviewable, that is unknowable, unimaginable, unless you're the person on the receiving end. Now, what we're about to talk about, getting back on track here, is the answers that the rest of us want, and a few that you don't need anymore. But again, your answers are for a different question that are more about you, I believe, personally and spiritually, and about you as a whole person that does not involve beings from the other side. Mm -hmm. That They acted as a catalyst for the change you are undergoing now. And that's what's important to me, as I see it about you as my friend. So what we're about to talk about now, as we've gone through all the material, the websites, the interviews, the TV shows from the 90s, it's not that extensive, but I've just collected a few bits here about, uh, which are essentially the conclusions, because as we've said before, that's what us humans do. We look for answers. I think if you're an interesting person, you do. I've met a few uninteresting people who don't care about anything. And that's fine, but they're not much fun to talk to. The people that are looking for answers as to what this is on this other side, apart from you, this is kind of what it is. It's like, who is this? Who is Sally? Who are these other ghosts that might be here at this one place? Is it something to do with the house itself? Or are these things just passing through? You remember and, that band from the 80s, Crowded House? I like them. Yeah, actually. Uh, That's yeah, what me, this house Tim, is. Tim, this is a crowded Tim, house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Finn Brothers, yes. Yeah. In some sense, I've made the joke that it's, uh, it's Grand Central Station. 
for a lot of spirits coming through. So these are some of the things that come up. And I thought there were a couple of good insights that are pretty generalized for what most people think is going on here. And I would just say that nobody knows for certain. I mean, you have your strong feelings, but I think as I said, uh, as we were discussing before this part here, you have a feeling of, you know what it is. Well, no, that's that, that's actually not quite Oh yeah, right. go ahead and, yeah, go ahead and. Uh, I'm not saying I know what it is. Right. I'm saying I know what the intentions or the message was that I was supposed to get from one particular source of energy. Okay, gotcha. And I got the message loud and clear. Right. I didn't need it to be super clear English. Yeah. I didn't need it to be, I got the message. So, right. but I don't know what sent the message. Right. And the other thing I'm saying is I don't care what's in it. Yeah. But also yeah. I don't think it's alone there. But I do think it might be the boss. Yeah, that's kind of the feeling I got, again, without feeling everything viscerally that you did. So there are some generalizations uh, about conclusions about what's going on there. We've jotted them down into this loose outline, and we're going to like read a few here. Basically, it's theories about what or whom or whatever is haunting the Sally house. One of the people that we really came to like and respect here was uh, the Pickman family. And Deborah has done a lot of work since that time, compiling evidence and uh, just good historical research, a little bit of genealogy. From her website, which is thesallyhouse.com. That's Deborah Pittman's website. So we're talking about Tony and Deborah, who we interviewed in the first part of this series. If you haven't heard that part that came before this one, I would go back and listen to it before you listen to this one. Right. She has all kinds of amazing stuff on there. So Yeah, so there's a section here I thought was really interesting. We tried to lock this down into something concrete that we can understand. And that's a good tack, though. I, a lot of paranormal investigators and researchers and authors will do is try and find somebody who, who was a real person who occupied this space in the past that, that this person might be. So that's the biggest question here. Is there a Sally? Was she a little girl? And who was it? So I thought that this passage here was interesting. I'm just going to read this from her website. Quote, the first time the Pickmans came to agree on the name of an entity living, residing in the house, took place after a co-worker of Tony's referred his sister, Barbara Connor, who reportedly has psychic abilities to visit the house. While in the home, Barbara was able to communicate with a little girl who called herself Sally. Barbara reported that Sally was seven years old and was suffering from pains in her stomach and hand and had a toothache. Sally also thought that Deborah Pickman was too bossy and had too many rules. Barbara also cautioned the Pickmans about leaving their baby alone because, like living children, Sally may unintentionally harm their son, Tyler. It was at this time that the drawing Tony Pickman had drawn after having a strangely vivid dream was that of the spirit Sally. So I guess, according to this website, that's uh, one of the first times the name Sally, S-A-L-L-I-E, which is also you know, more unusual spelling than I see. I usually just see it with a Y, mm -hmm. that that comes up. So I thought that's a good origin story, at least on the psychic side. So the story that you heard in part one of our series is the most common legend told about the Sally house. And that is of the little girl, Sally, who around 1905 died in extreme terror and agony. And in the moment before she died, vindictive anger towards the doctor who cut her open before the anesthesia took effect. That's how the story goes. So that's, again, as uh, the evidence is collected or EVPs or impressions, that whatever this is has anger more towards men. And it's a vindictive anger that's kind of playful, but at times a little bit violent. You see the role of that story about the doctor. It's yes. an easy frame to put this around is that whatever's happening, well, this does seem to happen to a lot of men that get targeted, especially Tony with the scratching. And then, you, you know, there's been some explanations or possible ones that said, well, maybe just the scratching. That's, uh, again, if you can't use your words, like we tell toddlers when they get angry, if you don't have that, then the scratching is the way they communicate. It's the way I can send a message that I'm here. Pay attention to me. We've heard that from a couple of people since we started investigating this was that a few psychics have told us that the scratches are, or light scratches anyway, are yeah. actually just a result of trying to communicate and not necessarily trying to hurt you. However, the ones that Tony was getting, which were bleeding yeah. and extreme, that's not the case with those. That's a more, yeah. that's a more serious kind of intentional harm type of contact. That's right. at least that's what we're hearing from some people. So yeah, I'm sure some people will bring up the condition dermatographia, which is a, a condition also known as skin writing, when people experience light raised kind of welts and lines and different, uh, maybe some different patterns. And that was addressed on the show sightings, where the parapsychologist Carrie Gaynor 
after the show aired, of course, we know what that's like. We can totally sympathize. Where you start getting a flood of letters from people with different theories. And it's like, it's like, oh, they wanted me to check into this. And we didn't mention it. And he said, well, I did research that. And uh, according to what he said on the show, that that is fine. That condition could explain some stuff, but not to the point where you start bleeding. That that is not an element of dermatographia. But explain what dermatographia is. Okay, so this is from the Mayo Clinic website here, and it's an overview of dermatographia, and it says, Dermatographia is a condition also known as skin writing. When people who have dermatographia lightly scratch their skin, the scratch is reddened into a raised wheel, W-H-E-A-L, similar to hives. These marks usually disappear within 30 minutes. The cause of dermatographia is unknown, but it can be triggered in some people by infections, emotional upset, or medications such as penicillin. Most people who have dermatographia don't seek treatment. If your signs and symptoms are especially bothersome, your doctor may recommend allergy medications such as cetirizine, Zyrtec, or diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. Basically, it's a pretty mild kind of thing. We heard about it because uh, Chris Cogswell brought that up, got very excited about that in the Pontifract series, and wanted to talk about it. It's like, well, in this show, it's a lot more relevant, but it's been addressed. And so our point, and also... Uh, parapsychologist Carrie Gaynor's point is that what Tony experienced goes way beyond that because then what you would say is that it, when people weren't looking, maybe Tony was kind of rubbing his skin or he scratched himself but didn't break the skin and then like, you know, five minutes later, then a welt raises. And that's what people are seeing on camera. Well, I don't know how you explain a scratch that starts off as a welt and then opens up and starts bleeding. Yeah. That people are dabbing actual blood off of. And the letters MC appearing on the small of his back, which has a direct tie-in to the history and timeline of this house, M.C. Finney, Michael C. Finney, the man who built the house. Yep. But a lot of these messages, I believe, again, as I said, the very top of the show in the, in the first part of the series, is from the untrustworthy narrator. Exactly. You can't trust anything that's coming across as being like, ah, we got the answer. It's this person. This is Sally. She was born here. Mystery solved. It's something playing with you. It's something messing with you. And it could be more than one thing. And they could be in cahoots. And it could have nothing to do with whatever it's pretending to be. Right. Now, here are some ideas put forth in that pamphlet we talked about that is handed out by the Atchison Chamber of Commerce when you go to do a ghost hunt or paranormal investigation at the house, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> it's a lot of, we'll get to these tips and tricks later, but it has a summation of some of these theories that are going around out there. So you kind of gives you a better idea real brief bullet pointed list of like what you might be up against. So here are some ideas about Sally's behavior and personality and that of other possible spirits. And it is from this Ghost Hunters pamphlet and also their book, Haunted Atchison, The Collected Stories. So it is said that Sally particularly dislikes men and goes after them because of the botched or unsuccessful surgery, most likely, and that she's exacting revenge on men or a transference of that anger about the last thing she saw, a man, to any man she now comes in contact with. And why does she scratch? Well, some say she's fighting back on the operating table. Now that's sticking with that origin story about her possibly being operated on by C.C. Finney and the appendectomy not going well. Again, that's pretty grounded. That's where our minds go mostly as to that story, I think, or most easily go to that story. But I think we and others who investigate paranormal activity would say, not that we're paranormal investigators by any stretch, but it's become apparent to us that scratching during most ghost encounters is pretty common, like Greyfriars. That happens a lot there. But it seems like it's a way for them to communicate, literally to reach out to the living. And uh, like all communication, though, sometimes it's friendly, sometimes it's neutral, and sometimes it's just conveying information, and sometimes it's an angry statement. Others believe that this house is haunted by Sally and an older woman who likes men. However, if this woman's affection is not returned, she becomes angry, then targets the men. Right, so that would be the woman that Tony saw that looked kind of like Deborah, Ooh. and then led him up the stairs yeah. into that back room, what is now the back room, which would be just across, there's uh, the nursery, then the restroom, and then there was another back bedroom there, and that's where she went in yeah. there and vanished, apparently. Yeah. Now, coming back to Peter James, the white-haired, black-eyebrowed and mustachioed psychic, who is well-known from the 80s, he was a very iconic figure back then. I yes, think if he he's, like, if he's like shows like passed this. away. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So yeah, I guess may, he has maybe all he the knows. Answers. Well, yeah. <laughs> you, you think so, but um, maybe not. That's another impression that I've gotten uh, just from hearing people uh, is that all the secrets of the universe may not be revealed to you. Obviously, there's a lot of ghosts that 
have passed on that seem really confused about True. what's happening to True. them. So <laughs> you may not get any answers. Well, the well-known psychic from the sightings episode on the Heartland Ghost series had been to the house twice, and he says on the show, uh, he feels that Sally, whoever or whatever she is, remains in that house. And the book goes on to say that the professional mediums from Ghost Hunter magazine also concur. And as the Atchison book says, several psychics and many paranormal investigative teams have visited the home. They feel Sally is present, but also claim that she is able to come and go from this dimension. But here's an angle uh, that I, I think makes sense, but you have to make the leap and believe in, in psychics and psychic abilities. The, the better answers you're going to get, I would say, are from the psychics in conjunction with the evidence you could gather. You have to kind of line that up. But yeah. really, what's the thinking going on on the other side? Well, probably going to come from a psychic, but again, yeah, you have to believe in that. So this comes from the Atchison book. Uh, Joyce, a well-known psychic who is now deceased, explained it this way. Quote, Sally is not tied to the place where she died. She is able to come and go at will. She is one of the fortunate ghosts. Some are in much turmoil as they leave this world, making them unable to rest. When a person is in thought of someone who has passed on, many times the spirit is able to be with you. Just your thoughts bring them close. People entering the Sally house are usually thinking of Sally, and it may bring her forth. However, those dark spirits are already there and have not yet found the peace to enable them to leave. Remember, we are only a single dimension apart. Unquote. So that was interesting. Well, the book goes on to say, quote, Beyond the presence of Sally, many agree there may well be several ghosts haunting the house, including a mentally challenged 14-year-old boy. Two psychics have corroborated that the vengeful ghost who physically attacked the homeowner in 1993 I guess that would be Tony Pickman. Yeah, that's Tony. Yeah. They, it says homeowner, but they were renters. Yes, exactly. Time, yeah. so I, I think the occupant uh, yeah. is not Sally at all, but an old woman who fell to her death at the bottom of the basement stairs. One of these psychics had a vision before ever entering the residence. She stated, I saw an old woman at the bottom of the wooden basement stairs, dead from a broken neck. I see her laying against a brick wall. Unquote. The book passage continues. Most basements of the old Atchison homes were built of rock from the easily accessible Kansas limestone quarries. But after checking, the wall at the bottom of the wooden stairs in the Sally House happens to be made of brick. So that's, again, touching on the limestone, stone tape kind of theory about residual haunting kind of things going on. Yeah. We were down there. Those are large bricks, at least the ones that were uh, making up the wall, uh, kind of the retaining wall and propping up the crawl space area. Yes. Didn't really check, but that's one psychic theory. I believe this comes from the pamphlet that's handed out to paranormal investigative teams or anybody that is brave enough to book an overnight stay. It says, regardless of who or what haunts the Sally House, there have been reports of unexplained noises and smells, disembodied voices, apparitions, and objects moving on their own. There have also been numerous reports of spontaneous fires. Some people have reported being scratched, bitten, and burned by an unseen entity while in the house. Yeah, and this fire stuff is scary to me because that's something that Tony experienced and is still experiencing even in their new house, which is about, yeah. a mile, you know, I guess roughly a mile away. Because I remember in the sightings episode, Peter James, his cheek was burning. We yeah. have all this evidence. Uh, they had the remote that was melted. They had the pen that was melted. And that's from uh, the Pickmans actually talked about that right. stuff. And the yeah. doll that caught on fire and other people that lived there talked about fires in the house as well. It wasn't just the Pickmans. Here's uh, what's fascinating to me is that it's control of fire. Imagine, like, if you had dry lace curtains or draperies, those go up. I mean, remember people had those old uh, Torshear lamps, I guess, where uh, they were, uh, I kind of like the light from them, mm -hmm. but they bounce the light off the ceiling. Well, unfortunately, I think this happened to a uh, jazz xylophonist, uh, Lionel Hampton. People would have the window open. The wind would come through the window, blow the curtains onto the top of these things, and they were really hot. That's why you got a lot, a lot of light reflecting off the ceiling would start a fire. My point here is that if you torch something or spark something, dry carpeting, draperies, furniture, it could be anything. Well, that often starts the whole house ablaze. That could have happened at any one of these times if you do believe that this thing was sparking fire or that fires for some reason in general could have been sparked. Now, what's interesting to me is that that could be more on the paranormal level where that's more like, I don't know, ball lightning or something weird sparking fire, but it's controlled. It seems intelligent. It appears in only certain places and at certain times. And it happened right on the body of Tony. 
I don't know if you saw it, Forrest, but back when we were doing the Black Monk of Pontefract, which seems like a billion years ago now, but it was only a few weeks. <laughs> within, within the season. <laughs> within the season. Tess had put together an interesting thing on fire poltergeist for one of our newsletters. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really fascinating. I asked her to resend it to me. And I just wanted to read like the first section from it, because this is fascinating to me, the whole fire aspect of this and all the stuff that Tony and Deborah talked about in the first part of our series is really fascinating. And of course, I have to hearken back to one of my favorite television show profiles of a haunting, episode three, season one, Paranormal Witness, where that demon kind of thing is torturing that family, that poor family. It would also start fires, but if I, I should really watch that because I quote it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it since it's been on. Yeah. What I remember, they would find like a frying pan in the hallway and a wad of toilet paper on fire. Yeah. That's when I first started to formulate this idea. It's like, is it trying to kill them and burn the house down? No. Its deal is to terrify them. Kind of like in the way a parasite, they often end up killing the host, but that's not the idea if it wants to live there. It's feeding off of these people. It's feeding off of their terror. So the ideal for whatever this thing is, is to keep them alive and to keep terrorizing them because they're not getting any braver. They're just getting more and more terrified. So... In the idea of starting a fire, again, is this a wad of toilet paper coming out of the bathroom, finding a pan coming out of the cupboards and then lighting itself on fire? They just said like, yeah, we'd find, we'd have to put it out. It would set the smoke alarms off, but yeah, we'd find like a, or, or a pie pan or something. So it's not just on the carpet burning the whole place down. It's meant to show you, look, I can start fires whenever I want. So that's the first time I heard of that. Like, wow, that is, that's pretty wild. Well, listen to what uh, Tess had wrote about this with regard to fire poltergeist. Chris Woodyard, the author of the Haunted Ohio books, wrote this about fire poltergeist. Quote, fire spooks are one of the strangest, most erratic, and most terrifying of paranormal entities. They cause outbreaks of inexplicable fires, sometimes dozens in a single day. Even damp objects combusted. The bewildered victims may extinguish one fire, only to find another erupting. I can't fathom what the mechanism might be, but there are centuries of reports about people with a mysterious talent for starting fires, usually girls or young women, end quote. And of course, or, this goes back to... Or Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore, yes. Unlike other poltergeist activity that manipulates the natural world, it appears that fire poltergeists are in a league of their own. This is from Tess. While water is common in poltergeist hauntings, it is by no means the only or even main phenomena happening in the home. However, with fire poltergeists, or as Woodyard calls them, fire spooks, the fire seems to be the main focus of their activity. She went on to actually add multiple other cases of fire poltergeists, which are really fascinating. So if you don't sign up for our newsletters, there's... That's a uh, good place to catch this extra information. There's a regular newsletter, and mm -hmm. then there's a Patreon Plus newsletter for our Patreon supporters where she goes a lot deeper on this stuff. Right. I just wanted to mention that because it is fascinating. The fire component of this is really fascinating. All right. So as we ramp up the more commonly known and discussed theories of what might be going on at the Sally House as far as uh, spooks and spirits and all that, there's one kind of final statement here. I believe this is from the pamphlet for people who are going there for a paranormal investigation. Quote, the historical records do indicate that a great deal of death, physical and mental illness, and marital problems surround both the Sally House and the house next door. Now, this would be 504 North 2nd Street, part of the Finney Plots of Land. Whether this is paranormal in nature or just coincidence is still to be determined. So this also mentions something that I brought up previously when we're going through the timeline. There's something about that other house, too. 504, not just 508, the Sally House. It's the one next door as well. So is it the ground itself? Is it the three-dimensional space that the house occupies? Is it the wood in the house? Well, we don't know, but we do know that as we discussed in the timeline, these houses are connected by family and people and apparently activity. All right, so before we get into our experience at the Sally House, as I mentioned previously, there's a fun pamphlet that's handed out by the Atchison Chamber of Commerce. And I thought that this section was a lot of fun because it ties in with something we've always talked about, I think way back in the Queen Mary, like an institution, a property owner, some kind of authority that manages a place or a space or an object coming to terms with weird paranormal activity at the place. And of course, people say like, well, that's part of it. They're, they're, you know, they're renting this out and they're pumping up the spookiness of it. And yeah, that is part of it, certainly. But also there are do's and don'ts. 
And I love this section because it not only gives some of the history in the pamphlet, but this is a section on paranormal do's and don'ts. And it's meant to be a guide for people who are going to do a more in-depth investigation there, but may not be experienced ghost hunters. You know, I've done hundreds of these and studied up on it, but anybody can do this. Anybody can go to the house and rent it. And if you're going to, here are some tips and tricks, some rules. So uh, first off, we didn't do any of these rules. <laughs> we did not. We weren't really aware of this pamphlet. We were just there for a brief tour. Well, we're going to talk about that. We had a, our trip there was very impromptu and sudden. Right. But we were kind of already aware just from our research and talking to other ghost hunters and paranormal researchers, kind of the things to do and not to do. And when you look at this, essentially, these are just good manners. <laughs> and you, you often see people who are behaving badly. Well, they're probably doing that at national parks, too. <laughs> Don't literally poke the bear. So here are some of their, what they would call the rules. Number one, do take photos and video recordings. You never know what will show up. Do use digital voice recorders or voice recording apps on your smartphone to record potential electronic voice phenomena, EVPs. Again, you never know what you may capture. We certainly didn't. Yeah. But we did try to get an EVP. We did. And, and we did. We're going to talk about that. The other thing it says is to take notes. They'll tell you it's a good idea to document stuff. And that's the truth. Because if you go and you have this experience and all these things are happening, it can get overwhelming, the things that are weird. And then you look back on it and you can't really track what was going on. So they talk about noting if you have any battery drains of electronic devices, this may be a sign that an entity is present. Do note also cold spots. Again, another sign that an entity is nearby. Do say a protection prayer prior to investigating, during an investigation, and after an investigation, if you feel it will help you. Do try to enjoy yourself. Don't provoke any entities you may encounter. You never know who or what it is or how powerful it may be. You may think that that's silly, but let me tell you, people that have had negative experiences and you think, well, I'm just going to shake it off or tell them to go away. This stuff can follow you around. And sometimes there are really horribly irreversible consequences. And I've heard that from some investigators. Just like we say about Ouija boards, you have to be careful of opening doors. You're not exactly sure how to close. Right. Don't ask any entities questions in a disrespectful manner or use profanity. We want to remind you here, as Forrest said at the top of this, this is a list of what to do and not do from an official organization representing the city of Atchison. <laughs> right. Do not tell them it's okay to touch you or use your energy. Remember that. For people who don't believe in any of this. And it's At all. all it's, and it's, it, it is humbug. You'll say that it's just a manner of pumping up the fear and excitement and just reading it is going to get you some kind of feeling when you get in there because now you're really expecting something talk to people that uh, something like this has happened to, and they'll tell you it's not always the case. A lot of times people aren't expecting something. They haven't been pumped up. They haven't been preloaded and prepped to see something strange. That's always the go-to that explains everything. And so they'll tell you, like, you weren't expecting anything and something just happened. You know, the other thing about this kind of stuff is that a lot of times it's subtle. Again, it's not the movies where something horrible happens like a final destination or a knife comes flying at you and stabs you in the eye. From the things that I've heard, these things slowly negatively chip away at you. And it could be divorce. It could be depression. It could be a string of bad luck that people have later attributed to some kind of negative spiritual experience. And that seems to be the way that it harms you. All right. So let's get to the last three don'ts here. They're getting increasingly serious. Right. Well, I found this to be interesting, the second part of this. Don't tell an entity it is okay for it to follow you home. That's what we're talking about. Because once you invite it home, it's like the Black Eyed Kids. Sometimes it happens with people. Things follow them because they've opened themselves up in some way or given tacit permission for something to happen. And again, that's playing with uh, Ouija boards or doing ceremonies where you're not really experienced and you don't know what you're doing. It's like picking up hitchhikers. Sometimes it's fun and you have a good chat and sometimes it doesn't end so well. So this is not good for the person or anyone else in the group. It has been known to happen. It's a very personal recommendation mm -hmm. for me. 
I think it's important to understand that you really have no idea what you're actually dealing with. Oh, well, that's what it says here. Don't use any form of magic. And that is spelled M-A-G-I-C-K. Notice that there's a K on the end. And for people in the know, that's a different form. You're not doing a, you know, sleight of hand, the three cups and the balls. So don't use magic with a K to try and connect with an entity. Again, you do not know who or what you are connecting with, nor do you know its intentions. You're blind on this side. It can see you. It's got the upper hand. Don't fiddle around with a few things you read in a book or you think you may know about. And from what I've heard from people who really do dabble in this kind of stuff, they wouldn't be doing this stuff anyway because they know what's uh, on the other side and how much trouble you can get into. As they say, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And here's the last thing. Don't assume that an entity is being truthful. You have no way of knowing if it is being honest about who or what it is and what it is telling you. Yeah, and I think a lot of people forget that with regard to this particular house and this case because I personally, you know, everyone's got their own impressions, I guess, and everyone has their own beliefs about what's happening there. But I, for one, am not convinced that what people are seeing, all respect to everybody we've interviewed and everyone that's experienced something there, it's not just what they're telling you, it's maybe what it looks like or what you think it is it doesn't have to be that. We don't know if it's possible for something dark to pretend to be a little girl. And that's yeah. something to remember. I think that's really important. You know, a lot of people in this house have heard children laughing. There are EVPs of children laughing. And maybe that really is children. Maybe there's a lot of different types of things in there. But maybe it's also a trick. And as we mentioned earlier, that's the untrustworthy narrator to this. You're coming in blind. It's telling you a story that maybe you want to believe, or maybe you don't believe, but you don't know what to trust. So you gather the evidence and you can formulate opinions, but just remember, you don't really know what the truth is here. And I'll just say finally to wrap up this section here, if you think this is all silly and and a lot of baloney, then I would say that's only because you have yet to experience a ghost interaction yourself. I would bet that you'll sing a different tune if you do. Chapter 4, The Encounter. All right, it's that time in this series for us to move on to the actual experience that we had in the house and the EVP that I wound up getting on our Panasonic RRDR60 while we were there in the house and and some other ones that we got. Just wanted to make it clear that what we're going to do tonight is talk about that particular experience. We're going to play that recording here towards the end of the show. And then we're going to be back with another episode on the weekend of November 9th, where we're going to get real analytical. We're going to share some additional evidence from other investigators, and then we're also going to get analytical with what we have. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. One of the cool things about this particular trip, even though it was impromptu, was that Forrest took our 4K full spectrum video camera and shot a bunch of video. And it was on the full spectrum setting, which means it looks like you're wearing Pepto-Bismol glasses. But (laughs) but it is interesting. And as a result, at the very least, the audio that was recorded allows us to corroborate some of the observations that we made. And more importantly, it documents pretty much the whole chain of events. Although one thing we should point out right away is that even though that is a kind of a bargain basement 4K full hey spectrum now. camera. It does okay. But you, what you're saying is it's not, as we mentioned, the $500,000 package of gear that now, you saw in sightings. But for what it does, it has a setting, to explain this further, that is the full visible spectrum. So like daylight, like when you see on TV, normal video being captured to card. But in... In addition to that, it is also showing you the infrared spectrum. And I had two infrared lights going on it, so the video looks a little pink. And to explain this earlier, we were talking with Scott, it's like it might seem pink when you're in the daylight inside the house, and then when you go in the basement or someplace dark, then it turns into automatically, of course, what you see on night vision on your usual ghost hunting shows. Because it's capturing everything, hence the full spectrum. But here's something interesting about it. You had intended to record continuously the entire time in the house, right? Yeah, I had a... And um, so what did you find? Well, (laughs) so as quickly as I could, because the tour is starting right now, I try to put my rig together, which again, I'm pretty fresh with the rig here. We haven't really done many of these. Set the camera up, got the two IR lights going on it, punched a bunch of buttons and hopefully got it into full spectrum mode with fresh batteries. 
And this is one of the few things that I noticed with me if people ask me if anything weird happened. And I didn't even really fully consider it at the time. But this camera records to a SanDisk SD card, 128 gigs. A big card should record for a few hours at least on high definition. So as we were going through the tour, what I noticed is that the camera shut off and did it about four or five times. So to be clear, there were a couple of times when you went to look down at it, because I noticed that while you were carrying it, you were not always looking through diligently looking through the eyepiece because you were trying to participate in the conversation and the exploration, yeah. which is fine. I'm not faulting you. No, for no, that. sure. But you would go and look at it and find that it had turned itself off. No, I noticed right away because, you know, out of the corner of my eye and, or in my peripheral vision, or as I'm looking at the viewfinder, it's one of those flip open, you know, you have a, a screen right there. That's how you see it. It just shut off because the camera had stopped. But here's what's strange is I guess I was more concerned or thinking about rapid battery drain because I'd heard that that happens with cell phones, with cameras anything electronic, there's a power drain that can happen rapidly, but it shut off. And again, I had used the camera just a few times before that to test it out, shot some test footage, let it roll for a while. It didn't really do that. It has not done that since. That is not a function of the camera. It should not stop or pause until you punch a button. So how you notice it is that when you go to review the footage, what it does, as soon as you hit stop, it creates a new file. So in our collection of video from that tour, there's like four or five files. I mean, how many are there? There's five, I think, files of uh, video clips. There's actually seven. Okay, <laughs> so that should tell you. I mean, they're varying yeah. lengths. One of them's only a minute long. Right. I remember having gone through all of them. I don't specifically remember you going through the motions of what seemed like pulling it up to your face to turn it off or turning or hitting it off. It seemed like it, every single one of them, it just stops. It just stopped. So what that tells me is that I would say between five and six times, because I, I may have stopped it once we stopped to go outside or this and that. Right. And uh, I think I stopped it once we had our recordings and I went back upstairs to try it again myself. That may have been intentionally stopped. So maybe five times the camera stopped on its own. Okay. I meant to just let it roll because we had plenty of memory storage space to let it roll the entire time. It was only going to be a little over an hour there. I think that's interesting. We just wanted to point that out. That on its own, maybe not that remarkable. Like I it's said, I Chinese, didn't even really it's notice. It's a Chinese camera. <laughs> okay. It was like $4. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> it does uh, very well. Look, but it's, before and yeah. since, like you said, it's not been cutting itself off. No, no, it functions fine. It's not the most expensive camera, but for what it does, it, it's fully functional and uh, it delivers a decent picture. And I didn't even notice it at the time. You know, it didn't strike me as like, whoa, the camera's shutting off and this is creepy. It was like, no, I get, I'm going to shut off. So I just hit the start button again. It didn't really even strike me till later on that that might be significant. You know, you just have to take the sum of everything that happened and decide whether it's significant or not. That points to also being part of my personal experience there at the house. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's how I processed it as not being much of a big deal. Which so, is entirely yeah, possible. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. To me, that's not paranormal or supernatural. I hadn't had that much experience with the camera. It could just be faulty. That was the moment where it just decided it was going to shut off. And I think that's kind of my mindset too. It's like, oh, we paid a little over $200 for this camera. Maybe that's crapping out now. But the batteries are fine. That's the story of the camera. The other thing that I wanted to mention was that tonight you're going to be hearing from Maria Miller again, who is the director of tourism in Atchison, who we had on in the last episode of this series because she was with us and we wanted to talk to her about what she remembered about the tour she gave us that day. So we're going to have her on just briefly tonight. These interviews are short. Don't get scared. There's, these are not right. two hour interviews. Uh, they're right. each one of them is, you know, 10, 15 minutes. You'll still be able to enjoy your Halloween evening. <laughs> you yes. will. Yes. We wanted to give you something that was digestible in the amount of time you have between now and trick or treating. So we're going to be hearing from not only Maria, but also um, one of our listeners who is someone who frequently comes out and offers us support when we're on the road. Her name is Megan Winning, and she's also a, a pivotal member of the Astonishing Research Corps and just an all-around really great volunteer, honestly. Yeah, she's our, our, our muscle in the field, yes. you know, our enforcer, you could yes. say. Yes, she yeah. makes things happen. Okay. And uh, then you're also going to hear from Tess, our head of research and I'm going to tell this part of this from yeah. my point of view, yeah, and I want go. you to ask questions And because I am still trying to figure out, or I, I think I'm still trying to process what happened, sure, even though this sure. was nearly 90 days ago or yeah. roughly three months. We said this a little bit before, but I just want to restate, going into this trip, 
I personally was focused on a complex talk that I was going to have to give on the Chasing Earhart panel that we had been invited out to participate in by Chris Evan Films, who has been doing the Chasing Earhart podcast and also a documentary that they're working on there. And so we were honored to come out and be a part of that, and we were interested in being a part of it. But my particular portion of the panel was dedicated to how many Electra 10s like Amelia's were missing in the world. And I was trying to be sure I had all my facts and figures straight and be sure that I could do a good presentation. That presentation on that panel that had something like 20 people on it, all of whom were much more prestigious than me and Forrest. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, that particular panel was happening just a few hours after these events yeah. that we're about to describe. You still delivered, my friend, well, I, I got to say. I well, mean, you, you look shell-shocked, but I put that down to just having to give a talk in front of an auditorium anyway. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And it was a great honor to participate in that, and I'm so glad we got to do it. But that was going to be the last part of this day. So the Sally House, we knew it was there. Chris Williamson had told us about it from Chasing Earhart, and he said, hey, you guys, you should do a show on this when you come. It's really amazing. It'd be such a perfect fit for Astonishing Legends. And we had every intention of doing that, but we got kind of overwhelmed with our schedule and all the other things we were having to do, so we kind of put it on the back burner. We were hoping to get by, but then we just figured we'd do a lot of research and go by and take some pictures maybe and cover it remotely after the fact. It still had a lot of worth because how often do we do a story we don't actually get to travel to the location? So we could just, even if we got photos, from the outside and looked at it and did a little legend tripping where you're just kind of poking around legally and respectfully, that's worth something. So that in itself would be a bonus if we ever covered it later. Yeah, exactly. And the invitation we got to go to the house was very impromptu. Maria Miller had contacted us and said, hey, look, I've got the keys. I'm heading over. I've got a little time. If you guys want to come over and check it out, let me know. And I seem to remember her saying, we need to be over there in like 30 minutes. And I thought, this is a great opportunity. We do have a little time before we have to go do the panel. So I'm pretty sure I just said, yes, we'll meet you there. It just sounded like a lot of fun. Yeah, we yeah. wanted to do it. And I kind of thought from my first interaction with Maria that we were basically going to get let in, look around 10 or 15 minutes right. and then be on our way. And I thought, well, this will be perfect. We can do a show on it when we get back. Yeah, take a bunch of photos. We'll take some pictures on the iPhone. I wasn't planning any kind of investigation. And we had so much going on. I think I just called Forrest and said, look, we got to go. I had my son in tow. And on top of that, my dad and stepmom were in town for the panel. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him, hey, you want to go check out the haunted house? So we wound up all piling in the car along with Megan and Tess. The main thing that was going on for me, though, was I was in a place where I thought probably nine out of 10 haunted houses or haunted hotels are, I'm just going to say it, tourist trap. <laughs> <laughs> and I was familiar with the story of the Pickmans because I had seen some shows on it, probably the sightings, even though I'm, it's not a super clear memory for yeah, me like when I was me, younger. Right. I feel like Paranormal Witness might have done a show on it too, but there was mm -hmm. something I had seen more recently. And I didn't doubt that story. It sounded like an amazing story, but I thought this is probably just something that happened a while ago. And I do believe in those kinds of stories mm -hmm. and we'll cover it and it'll be interesting, but I thought it had probably blown over and this was more of a scene of the crime type of location. Yeah. You come and you look at it and you're like, oh wow, all this stuff happened here. But right now, it's an old house. And I compare it to hotels I've been to that will say they're haunted and you go and you stay in the hotel and you stay in the most haunted room. I don't want to name any because I don't want to malign any hotels, but you do and, it, and nothing happens. Right. And I think, well, is a hotel. It really behooves them to have people who are into this stuff think yeah. that they're haunted. And then I'm thinking, well, it's Atchison. It's a small little town. It's got this claim to fame with Amelia, yeah. which is really awesome. She was born there and the house is still there and all of that is super cool. But how much more, you know, the most haunted town in Kansas, I was, I was thinking, well, yeah, it's probably got some old houses that are haunted and that's probably pretty cool. But when it came to the Sally house, I, I thought, well, it's a haunted house. Something probably happened there. We're getting a chance to go over and walk through it. I'm not really expecting much. You're John Cusack from 1408. Well, I can't remember much about 1408. <laughs> well, he's a paranormal travel writer, and he goes around to these different haunted hotels, and he stays there, and then he kind of like, I think he writes like travel blogs and, and articles and stuff. And then yes. you know, most of the time, nothing ever happens, or none of the time <laughs> anything ever happens. So he's pretty skeptical, but he, he goes there and checks it out. Yeah. So I guess that's where I was at. I'm not saying that I'm skeptical. Obviously, I'm not. We do this show because I'm into this kind of stuff. But here's the point that I wanted to make. That version of me that got in the car to go to that house that day is gone. That person doesn't exist anymore. I'm a changed man, for lack of a better word. Yeah. And I'm still trying to figure out how to live with 
what for me internally is a massive paradigm shift. So if I was given the opportunity again from where I'm at now, I would have taken an entirely different approach to our mm. visit to the Sally House. Would you have still gone? Yes. I, I guess not feeling what you did now because there's a lot of it that's been unpleasant, shall we say, that I've noticed about you. But if you had been presented with the opportunity that this is really going to change your thinking in maybe some uncomfortable, but also some pleasant ways, would you have gone? If I'd have known what did happen to me was yeah. going to happen, yeah. no, I probably wouldn't have. But I can only make that observation in the hindsight of right. having done it now and exactly. been exposed to it. Right, right. If you'd have said, you might get proof of a ghost and that kind of thing, and maybe you'll take a picture and something weird will be in the mirror, mm -hmm. which a lot of people get in that house or other houses in Atchison for that matter. I would say, yeah, that's cool. I'll go do that. That yeah. would be interesting. I would not have gone and wanted to set out to get what we wound up getting. But I would have just approached it with more seriousness. And that's significant based on what you're going to hear moving forward from other people who were advising us about the situation. There was a reason that what happened to me with this recording happened to me, and it might have been related to my skepticism or sort of lackadaisical attitude towards the house and its occupants, whatever they are. That may have led it to be attracted to me. But the other thing about the shift that I've experienced, and I want to tell our listeners this because you guys have been, a lot of you have been with us from the beginning. You know, I've been on a journey on this show. And I think the other thing that I want to say is that I have to recognize now that I'm probably going to have a shift in my confirmation bias when it comes to ghost stories, because now I feel like I've encountered a ghost. And ghost for me is too polite a word for whatever <laughs> left that recording for us. Mm. I remain the same, unchanged on <laughs> UFOs and cryptids, because I haven't personally had a significant <laughs> experience with either one of those. And I still like to talk about them, and I would love to experience something from a safe distance. But my assessment of hauntings and the possibility that any given haunting is real has shifted. How do you feel about people's personal testimony when you hear it? How does your uh, view on eyewitness testimony, let's say, because we get tons of letters saying, like, you can't trust any of it. It's all faulty. It's all suspect. And a lot of times it is. We've talked about this. How do you feel about that now? I would say in cases where I'm talking to people, specifically as it relates to this particular branch of the paranormal, I think in the past, when I've done interviews, I might have been incredulous about some of the things they've experienced, but I wanted to get all the details anyway, because I was trying to suss out whether or not they're telling the truth based on how they tell the story and how genuine they seem. I'm now probably going to be giving more benefit of the doubt to people in certain situations based on, you know, we still got to do sure, our research, of but yeah, I, we don't I, believe everything out of the gate. No, we don't. And I'm not saying that I do, but I guess what I'm saying is some of the stories that we've covered, I've thought, well, that can't be possible. If that's possible, that means this whole slew of other things mm -hmm. about spirituality, the universe, what happens after we die. That's all kinds of stuff that that opens up. And so I'd rather just think they had an experience that was real, but they didn't really understand. Mm -hmm. Now, my belief is going to more likely be they had an experience that was real. And now what I have to deal with is the fact that that whole part, all that part that I just mentioned, does in fact exist. We've talked a lot about, even in teasing this coming up to this Halloween series, we've talked a lot about how this particular experience is very personal to me. It feels like a personal experience to me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to explain that there's two reasons that I feel that way. One of the reasons is that I sent to everyone in the nursery where this recording was made at the Sally House, I sent everyone in that room, out of the room and downstairs. And I was alone in there. And I'm not sure what was in my head when I decided to set up that EVP. The only thing I knew prior to that was that I had had a strange feeling in my chest. And we'll talk about that in a second. But there was a strange feeling in my chest in that room. But it wasn't ominous. It was just like a pressure. It was almost like you had some uncomfortable piece of clothing on, hmm. like a shoe that was too tight. Was it anything similar to what you felt in Kent at the Kent stage at the Paranormal Weekend there? Yes. It, it was, was similar. nearly identical in its nature, but it was a good three or 400% more present. Hmm. What I felt in Kent was kind of faint. Yeah. This was not faint. Right. It was real precise and deliberate and there. Kent so, still made you want to leave. I, I remember yes. you, you had to get upstairs quickly. Yeah. And that was the first time anything like that ever in my whole life has happened to me. All of that, 2018. Mm -hmm. I'm going <laughs> through some kind of weirdness here. So yeah. 
I had had that feeling, but even when I was making the EVP, I was honestly more thinking, well, we got this cool recorder, which we talked about, the Panasonic RR DR60. I don't want to get into all the stuff about that recorder in this episode. Mm -hmm. If you go back and listen to our Kent episode. Yeah, EVPs at the KPW. Yeah, you'll hear us talking there about this particular recorder and why we have it. And it's hard to get. It's very expensive, even though when it first sold, it was probably $20. But people have a lot of people get them because they're particularly good at getting EVPs. We didn't even remember to bring it. Here's the thing about that. Mm -hmm. Again, it goes to the person that I'm not anymore. <laughs> I knew that I was leaving it behind. Yeah. And oh, I you didn't, did? I didn't care. Really? Yep, because I thought we were just going to go to an empty old house where something spooky happened in the 90s. Oh, man. Didn't you read the do's and don'ts pamphlet? Always I, record. Always nobody gave recorded. me the pamphlet. All that happened to me was all I was thinking about was that panel. And then we got a phone call. It's like, I got the keys. I'm going to let oh, you in. I was right. like, OK, let's pile in the car and go over there. Right. Then we can look at it. And then we can at least say we went there yeah. if we do a show on it. That's where I was at. And I was like, oh, the recorder. I was just like, oh, we don't need it. We're not doing all that kind of investigation. You That's know, interesting. But, but then Thank you brought the I camera. Brought, well, I brought my adventure bag. It's yeah. got all that stuff in it. Because of course, it has like 25 different types of go bags. Uh, yeah, well, this is the one that we traveled with. But I brought all that because why have the gear if you're not going to use it? That was my thinking about the DR60. It's like some good money was spent on it. Why keep it at the hotel? Here's the other thing. A lot of times something will happen and uh, it's that kick yourself moment where it's like, oh man, I should have had my camera going. Well, yeah. So getting back to why I felt this was particularly personal was because at the moment that I made the recording, I did have the recorder. I was alone in the room and I specifically said, if anything wants to talk to us, I was the one making the request. And then I came up and collected the recorder and went down to play it back. And here's the part that I can't convey that is a little bit more about why it's so personal to me. The way that I feel when I hear this recording, I can't possibly describe. And it feels incredibly invasive and personal, and it feels like pure hate directed at me. And I cannot describe it. I don't just hear the screaming on the tape. I hear the screaming of something that I'm beholden to. I can't imagine what it's like to be an abused child. I was not an abused child. I had an amazing upbringing, great loving parents, no problems there. But I guess I've seen fictionalized versions through movies and TVs and books of what it's like when an enraged parent yells at a kid. And now that I have a kid, that's a particularly visceral thing to try and understand. And that's what it felt like when I played that recording. So that's why I am describing this as a personal experience specifically to me. And while we're here just right now, I actually wanted to play a couple of quotes from Tony Pickman regarding the recording, because during the course of our interview with Tony and Deborah Pickman, I told them about the EVP and then I sent them the file and I let them listen to it. So this first clip, it's very short, but it's just a little soundbite of Tony reacting to what I was saying when I told him, and we didn't use this in the interview, when I told him how it made me feel when I listened to it. The feeling you described with it, it I would get that feeling. It was just a total angry, I can't explain it either. It, it was a horrible feeling. I'm having common ground with Tony Pickman here, and I'm not comparing myself to him because he lived in that house for a couple of years, and he's been living with this issue for decades now. I was only in there for about an hour and a half. But in that brief time, something singled me out and wanted to give me an experience that was similar to something that he could relate to. And he gets it. I can tell that he gets how I feel about that recording. And as a result, I can say that I get how he feels about the things he's experienced because I've had that feeling now and it's not a feeling I've ever had in my life. So my point is, yes, it's very personal. It's very personal to me. The recording feels very personal to me. And there's a component of that that I'm not ever going to be able to explain to anybody. And I don't care if that makes me look foolish because I wanted to put it in the show and I wanted us to talk about it. So that's what we're doing. So as we said, we were kind of rushed to the house. Forrest, I don't, do you remember how it came about? Like, do you remember me calling you and saying, hey, Maria just called. She's going to take us over to the, do you remember anything well, we, about that? Well, we had known that it was a possibility. We just didn't think it was going to come together because, uh, you know, there was some miscommunication as far as like what we thought, how it was going to happen or not. When the town was slammed with the Amelia Earhart Festival too. I mean, they were blocking off oh, streets. No, it's all a big deal. There's a street carnival. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a really a fun time to be there. They pull out all the stops, but 
you know, we had our own thing to be concerned with, and we were pretty nervous about being on that panel that day. We were kind of prepared to speak. Scott had a little bit of a presentation he was going to make, but, you know, we were just nervous for that because we don't know what to expect there as well. So we weren't really thinking about it. And then this opportunity comes up, and I don't remember exactly how, um, you know. I feel like I called you. You may have so called me. a memory of saying oh. or texting you and saying, we can go if we go now. Yeah. And, you know, I think we were just kind of waiting around. There wasn't a whole lot other stuff to do other than the panel that afternoon. So I grabbed the bag. Everything was kind of ready to go. It's like, well, look, it's all bagged up. Let me just meet you downstairs. And you got everyone else together. Yeah, we all piled in the car. Now, and this is something, we rented a big car because we knew we were going to have a big crew. So we had rented, it was actually a 2018 Cadillac Escalade. Brand <laughs> very new, nice. Like yeah. huge, like driving a freight train. But uh, it was real nice and it was very comfortable. So we piled everybody into that and we rode over to the house, which is only really about a mile away. We we're staying at the Holiday Inn Express yeah, on Main Street in Atchison. Yeah. And I, I just want to point out, by the way, that's a fabulous hotel. I love everyone you know, that works new. there. Yeah. It was really a great place to stay. So you go into town and look for a hotel. I would put that one at the top of the list. But we uh, drove over there and we beat Maria there. So we were just sitting out in front of the house. We pulled up in front of uh -huh. it. And along the way, my son, who was nine years old, had been excited to go to it. And he knows about the show. The forest is over <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. And he hears us talking. He sees me doing research. And so he knows a little bit. We used him for the Black Eyed Kids publicity shot that we did. So, you know, he's been exposed to things, but he doesn't really listen. He's not listening to the podcast. And I certainly haven't told him about some of the darker episodes that we've done. Right. You know, as a kid grows up, you kind of learn, well, I think, what things are a scare trigger and what things he's okay with. And it's like, good example, it's the, uh, like the Grim Reaper. That's what he's going to be for Halloween. Yep. He's you down know? with that. He's down with that. And and the uh, the idea of dressing up like that, well, that was kind of cool. He wanted to know more about it. It's like, you guys should do a show on the Grim Reaper. So right. he knows of the idea, but as we said in the show, it's a fantastical comic book hero right. kind of idea. That's how kids visualize this stuff. But the concept doesn't really bother him. Again, as I was going to the house, I was thinking this is going to be an old house and we'll go in and we'll hear creepy stories about things that have happened here. But I didn't expect a whole lot of it. However, when we pulled up in the car and we stopped in front of the house, he essentially looked out the window at it and said, I don't want to go in. I think it took him maybe two or three seconds mm -hmm. after we stopped. He's just like, I don't want to go in there, dad. I got to be honest. It struck me a little bit too. I mean, of course he's my son and I love him a whole lot. And obviously I feel a, a very intense bond with him. But there was something about his voice that did strike me. Mm -hmm. I, I did not make any effort to encourage him to go in after he made the request the very first time. There's other situations we might have been in, and he might have said, I don't want to go in the mall. I don't want to, not mm -hmm. right now. I want to sit. And I would have been, no, you're coming in with us. Well, right. you know, you don't get a choice here. But there was something about the way he said it that said to me, no problem. And so he didn't have anything to do, though. So I gave him my iPhone, of course. Luckily, he's uh, really content and easily distracted by any screen. Yes, as, as like every all kids. As every days. kid is these days. So I handed over the iPhone, and he proceeded to play a game. And we got out of the car. Forrest unloaded the uh, camera and everything as we waited for Maria. And Maria pulled up not too long after that. We'd only beat her by maybe five minutes. The last thing that my son said to me before we went towards the house was don't stay in there too long. Mm -hmm. No, I think he was just scared. So I'm not saying he, that was some kind of ominous right, right. Damien type of warning, but just, <laughs> uh, he, he was just, didn't want to be in the car by himself in front of that house. Yeah. When I think back on the possibility or the idea that I might have forced my son to go in the house or said, you got to come in and might've exposed him to that thing. I feel so horrible inside. I am so glad that he took a look at that house and just said, nope, I'm not going in there. Well, there was no one really to watch him. I guess we could have had, uh, if, if they were available, maybe Chris or Vanessa were, you know, in town, were able to watch him. I don't know. Bring well, we were, matters, no, but... well, we were headed to the panel. Yeah. We're... This was not on our agenda. Yeah. So... So, so there was really nowhere to foist him off and let him be taken care of by anybody else. So we kind of had to bring him. But at the same time, I kind of knew that he wasn't going to dig it because I, I know both of you pretty intensely now very well. And there is a sensitivity there. There's a great empathy, which is a really good thing. But I just had this feeling. It's like, ah, I don't know if he's going to, he's not going to dig this. And I don't fault you at all. It's just like, well, yeah, let's see how he does. So he wisely chose not to do anything within the house. And we've thought about this. Like, did he get some kind of gut feeling? It's like, no, this isn't good. 
Yeah. Or was it just, again, the strangeness of it and uh, the energy of all of us kind of talking about it? Because Scott and I are very careful not to discuss anything weird that we're researching around him. Yeah. He does not know about the EVPs or the recordings or right. any of the evidence that we gathered or anyone else has gathered in that house. For him, it was just the haunted house. He didn't go in that day. Yeah. And I hope for many years to come, he just, his idea of a haunted house is just the fun stuff that he sees around the neighborhood that the, uh, you know, the neighbors put on, dress up and put makeup on and, and jump out at stuff and not the true nature of a haunted house. So anyway, Maria came along. She took us into the house. She had the key. This is what she does for anybody that wants to go to the house. She's the boss of the house. She lets you in. She lets you out. She knows when people are there and when they're not there. Mm -hmm. Les, the landlord, who you heard from in our last episode, he lets the Chamber of Commerce manage that, and that duty falls on her. She's the liaison. If you're interested in a tour, that's the person you're going to deal with. Just calling back a little bit to my son, when we had originally hoped to stay in the house for several hours and maybe record there, we talked about yeah. doing that in the evening one right. night. And at that point, we were going to leave my son with uh, Chris and Vanessa, the Chasing Earhart folks, because they have a son. And he and my son are good friends. They yeah, like to hang out. Right, so right. That was the plan. But that all kind of went away because we were just like, we don't have time to go sit over there for several hours. Yeah. So anyway, that's that. I had, I had no intention, by the way, of taking him there for that anyway. So I just wanted to say that. Knowing what I know now, I, had, I would have no intention of leaving you in the house with me in a nighttime situation. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure I would have <laughs> enjoyed that. But who knows? We might have had a different experience. Maybe less that's true. would have happened. That's true. You know, Maria took us into the house. We went in, so The first thing she did was take us around the back of the house because the back used to be the front, which mm -hmm. we've mentioned before. There was First Street was back there and it got washed away in a flood. And at that point, they reversed the fronts of all the houses that had been built on that street. Of course, at that time, it might not have been a whole lot of them, yeah. but it became a second street address. And so she talked a little bit about that and explained how downstairs would have been where C.C. Finney, Dr. Finney, would have had his offices when he lived there yeah. in the house that his father, M.C. Finney, built, Michael Croman. Finney. So she explained that Finney's offices would have been downstairs, the family would have lived upstairs, and people would have come there for medical assistance. And by the way, I know that we said that CC worked for, originally for another doctor who worked for the railroad. CC also, I'm pretty sure he also worked for the railroad as a doctor too, but he must have had maybe this private practice or an additional practice in his home. I'm not sure exactly how yeah, all that sure, worked, but I'm I know sure that he him. was an employee of the railroad. Okay, I, I know right. that for a fact, yeah. I don't know how common it is nowadays, but back then, you needed a space. So you may have rented downtown office space. I think uh, At CC, one point, he did have yeah, an office yeah, downtown. Down, yes. Right, he had an office downtown. But if you had the proper facilities, you could operate, you know, in a converted house, which is kind of what this was. Like you just saw patients down where the kitchen and the living room would be. So the next place that Maria was going to take us was down in the basement. And the door to the basement is in the kitchen there. And we have posted JPEGs of the floor plan with this episode of the show. So if you want to get a feel for how the house is laid out, we have the basement, the first floor and the second floor on there. And that is floor plans that we got from Deborah Pickman's website, thesallyhouse.com. So she opened the door to the basement and she went to turn the light on and the light wouldn't come on. Again, small thing, maybe nothing. Maybe the lights just burned out, whatever. But she seemed genuinely surprised about it. We've gone back and watched the video footage that Forrest has. And you can see that she's like, God, that's so weird. That's, that's not really happened before. And then she's like, I want you to know I didn't stage this. I'm not trying to freak you guys out. <laughs> I don't know why it's not coming on. So we don't know if it was burned out, if there was something else going on, but it reminded me of Tony and Deborah talking about how they went to less and were like, you got electrical problems here. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of stuff going on, which later turned out to be maybe more supernatural than electrical. Mm. But for whatever reason, when we were there, there was no light in the basement. Yeah. But we weren't daunted by that. Nobody was freaked out. Nobody was creeped out. You're going to hear from Megan and Tess and me and Forrest about that. We were all ready to go down in the basement. So Forrest, of course, with his one of his go bags had like different <laughs> sources of light in it. We went to get a flashlight and we went down there. I also had Forrest's iPhone since my son had mine in the car. And I was using that to take pictures and some video as much as I could. So as we went down into the basement, it was, you know, it was cold. It was damp. <laughs> It was creepy. I appreciated the cold and dampness or the coolness of it because it was a hot, muggy day in Atchison. Yeah. So I felt relief and uh, a bit of joy because that's also where the air conditioning unit pipes into, I believe, from the outside of the house. And yeah, there's a central air system that's clearly been added to it, the house not too long ago. But another piece of gear I had that I forget to mention, I actually forget I had it on, is I started up the uh, EMF meter I have. Yes. And I just put that in my pocket 
and uh, just turned it on. And it only went off one time in the house as we were walking down the stairs. Into the basement. Into the basement. It's not really a, a rumpus rec room type of basement. It's more for storage. You can stand up in it. It's a full-size basement, but it's small. And as we're going down the stairs and it's dark, now I'm also looking into the uh, viewfinder of the camera, which has now gone into infrared mode. So I can still kind of see what's going on. And the infrared lights are, are illuminating everything. So now it looks just like a ghost hunter show where you could see people and, and there's one flashlight shining regular light. And also, I think I had a, uh, my UV flashlight going. Yes. So you can see that kind of illuminating in the frame. And I had forgotten about the EMF meter. And then suddenly it goes off with its alarm. So it's set real high, but it'll just go beep, dee, 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 you know, and this kind of goes off and it's like, all right, we got a hit. We got something. And the first thing you look at where I was looking around for is uh, we're in the basement. Is there a fuse panel here? Are there electrical conduits? Is there a motor here for something? You know, are we near the air conditioner unit? None of that was around. This is a very old house. So there's not a lot of electrical stuff going on. And yeah, it, the, I mean, you know. well, to be fair, you say none of that's around. The AC unit is in there and the unit is down there. But one of the things we should point out with these meters is they have to be really close to a source to react. So the fact that the AC unit was maybe eight feet away from where you were when it went off. At least, yeah. At least. It's too far away, even if it had like a transformer in it. Well, no, here's the thing. You can walk right up to it and it's not going off unless yeah. you put it right next so to the I just wanted motor. to make that clear. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. I, yeah, I want people to know that. Also, you might be thinking it's our cell phones. Those were in airplane mode. Everybody knows to put them in airplane mode so you're not affecting any of the other gear. We really couldn't find any other source. I didn't even have my phone. And it spiked there. It gave off a really high reading. And only in this one spot, this is what was weird. So I walked down a few steps, it, it, it went off. I walked back up to the doorway, it went off. It was only in one certain spot. There is a story that a woman fell down the stairs and broke her neck. We just read that. That's one psychic who... That would be right around that, that area. Uh, it's where the tripping would have started yeah. uh, with her falling down the stairs and maybe breaking her neck, but her head coming to rest against some bricks, which yeah. were right... That's The stairs are abutted right against the brick wall there, so... It only went off there once, and then, as you would think, with some kind of electrical source or something that's not shielded very well, it would keep going, and then it stopped. And the EMF meter did not go off the entire time, Rest either in time. that spot or anywhere else in the house. So who's to say? I didn't feel any cold drafts other than the one near the air conditioning unit, which, again, I welcomed because it was hot out. And that was it. I didn't feel anything weird, no tingles. It was just like the meter went off right in that one spot, and that was it. Well, and to that point, none of us felt anything. And right. I, I want to make that clear. A lot of people have talked about the basement. I want to make it clear that I wasn't having any weird feelings at all. Megan wasn't having any weird feelings. Tess wasn't, and they're going to talk about that. Nobody was. We were all down there. It was dark. It was cold. It was damp. And here's the thing about that. You would think you might be having weird feelings because on the floor, we'd heard this story about the pentagram right. on the floor. The story that you've heard, if you listen to the first part of this series, you heard the current owner of the house and the house, the owner for the past almost probably 30 years, if not longer, Les Smith verified that he did in fact find a pentagram on the floor in the basement that one of his tenants had left. And we could see where that had been attempted to be covered up. It had been painted over, and it was Les that did that. He covered it up. If you want to hear about that, you need to listen to the episode before this one. If you didn't, because it was four hours long, you should go back and listen to it. If you can't do four hours, just do the last hour where Les is. But he talked about that pentagram, and we could see evidence of it. And one would think that with us in there in the haunted house and also my disposition about, you might think that my disposition might have started to shift there a little bit, and it did. When I found out that the story about the pentagram was likely true. We hadn't talked to Les yet. Right, right. But have, seeing that smudge on the floor, I remembered my dad was with us, and my dad is a civil engineer. <laughs> I can't even <laughs> Is he a skeptic? He's yeah, a he's metallurgy. Pretty... And, no, I wouldn't describe him as a skeptic. I would describe him as open-minded. Mm -hmm. Not with strong beliefs one way or the other. Right. He looked down at it, and he thought, well, maybe there was a furnace here, mm -hmm. and that's just the blackness from the furnace. But the blackness is really from the paint that Les applied to cover up the pentagram that was actually there. But we didn't know that at the time. No. But I admit that it was, I was a little bit like, oh, okay, this looks like trace evidence related to a story that I thought was apocryphal about this house. And I just want to add here, I know that uh, we have a lot of people uh, who are very knowledgeable about pentagrams, let's just say, in our listening audience, and who might be thinking or writing to us that pentagrams aren't all bad. They are sometimes used depending on the intent and the way that they're laid out for good. 
or for positive things. But I just want to state here that it wasn't just the pentagram that was on the floor. There were also names that had been written on the walls. And that, in addition to the pentagram and the names and an assessment by a demonologist, all I want to say... As well as his exactly. friend, who as, was a Catholic priest. Exactly. So, And as well as a Catholic priest who is knowledgeable in this kind of stuff, I just want to say here that the intention of this was not good. It was not positive. It was not of the light, if you're thinking that's maybe what it was. So that was one kind of rumor about the basement that, for us, has been set straight. Turns out to be true. A lot of the details around the story were fabricated or exaggerated, but the actual story of the pentagram being on the floor in the basement, we have confirmed that is 100% true, as told to us by the owner of the house who personally witnessed it and then kicked the person who made it out of the house that day. There's another reason for that as well. It's not just because you might be thinking Les got spooked. There was other damage to the house that as well. That particular tenant was yes. tearing the house up right. and being disrespectful to the property overall. Yeah, it wasn't just the freaky pentagram. It's uh, just being a bad tenant. You might have thought that I would be getting spooked down there, but none of us really were. But it was interesting. All right, I think this is a good time for us to hear what this experience was like through somebody else's eyes. And we wanted to start out with Maria Miller, the director of tourism for Atchison, who is the one that got us into the house. You heard from her some in the last episode of the show where she talked about the experience of being a tour guide for the house and the different things that have happened to her there, which is ongoing. We just heard from her tonight as we're recording this about an additional encounter. It's just ridiculous. You can just go on and on and on with all of the evidence and experiences that people continuously have in there. And that's unusual for the kinds of things that we usually cover. You Usually it's you're searching for any shred of proof <laughs> and not every encounter generates proof, but people are experiencing things there all the time. And Maria is one of them. This place pays off like a slot machine, let me tell you. <laughs> and, and she just had an experience, I believe, a couple nights ago or very recently. Yeah, that's correct. So we're going to join her interview here at the point where I asked her, you know, I talked about if she remembered the day that we went, because she's there a lot. She takes a lot of groups there, and I wasn't sure she was going to remember it, and I didn't want to put her on the spot about it, but she did the day that we were there. My first question for her was, uh, you're over there a lot, right? And here's how she answered. I do go into that house quite a bit, especially this time of year. It is a privately owned house, but we manage it for the owners in terms of overnights, paranormal tourism, self-guided tourism, um, just a wide range of events, which include a lot of tours for me. And so that particular day, I do remember taking you four through the house. So I gave the tour like I normally do, where I start in the back and I point out that there was a first street that ran through Atchison. And so anybody that was coming to see the doctor would come through that back door because that was actually the front door at the time. And the downstairs would have been the office and operating space. And then the family would have lived upstairs. So I walked you through the house, took you downstairs. We did the tour like I normally do. And I know that you took the recording up into the nursery and the nursery is probably the most active room from what I know and from what people have shared and from what I've read in all the journals of the house and what my experience has been. And I think you asked some questions, if I'm not mistaken, maybe if anyone's there and they want to talk, you know, kind of what's pretty typical when people are on a paranormal investigation, just talk into this right here. And I remember you coming downstairs and like immediately saying you were leaving the house. I'm leaving the house right now. Yeah. Like I just remember you having the space and, and you didn't want to talk about it around, around your son. And so um, I came outside and you took us around. I remember to the backyard. I forgot about that. I didn't want him to see that I was rattled. Yeah, I remember that. I totally and forgot so about that. And so we went to the backyard and you played it and it was clearly yelling at you. It was something yelling into the recorder. Yeah. Clear as day. Yeah. And you looked at me and I, re and I actually remember this. You said, I don't think you should ever go into that room again. <laughs> you said, I think you can show it to people, but don't ever go in it again. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. And then you stayed outside still trying to grasp your head around what you saw. And if I remember correctly, the two girls that were with you kind of had an uneasy feeling as well and are looking down at their arms and started seeing almost what looked like red scratches. Yes, Megan and you remember Tess. That? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And we have photos and... of those. They were faint and we have photos of them, but the, the unusual thing about them, and I, I remember talking to Forrest about it after the fact, and he was like, I don't know, you know, maybe they brushed on something. But the thing that struck me about them is that they were the exact same intensity, the exact same shape, in the exact same place on both of their right arms. That's right. I remember them both showing their arms. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think they eventually faded, if I'm not mistaken. By the time they went back in and came back out, they had faded. So it wasn't like they were just these scratches that were going to be there. And it was, I remember that was crazy. Yeah, that was very unusual. So I went back in the house with Forrest. So I think it was just the two of us. And he went back up to the room and shut the door. And then I came downstairs. I was like, I'm just going to let him have his moment and ask his questions or, or do what he needs to do. But then all of a sudden I felt this really heavy feeling on my heart, like just on my chest. It was just... And I get it sometimes in that house and in certain rooms, and it always is different depending on the people. And then I remember kind of slowly walking up the stairs when he was still in the bedroom. And I sat down at the top of the stairs, which I never do. I just sat on the stairs and I just had this feeling like somebody was sitting next to me, almost looking for reassurance that it's okay to go back into the nursery. It was just this peculiar feeling. Okay. Yeah. That feeling on your chest, I know exactly what you're talking about it because I had it and then Megan had it as well when we first were in the house and when we Mm -hmm. went upstairs into the nursery and then the other bedroom on that side of the house, we had that feeling in both of those rooms and we were describing it to each other. And at that point, you were with Forrest and I believe Tess and then my dad and stepmom in the front bedroom, what is now the front bedroom. Yes. But Megan and I were talking about that exact feeling. So you get that frequently when you go over there? So I will tell you, it's always different. There are days when I go into that house and it is calm and it is quiet and there's nothing Uh or it's just very peaceful. And then there are times when I go in there that I'm just, I have a feeling like maybe I'm not supposed to be in the house today or sometimes just with particular rooms. Like maybe I shouldn't be in this room today. Right. Um, But it's a feeling that's, it's not always there. So whatever that is, isn't always in the house. Right. If that makes any sense. That's something that's going to come up with other people's perspectives as well. And I'm coming around to it the more and more that we explore this and have been trying to spell out this particular experience that we had in the house. It does feel like sometimes it's not there and that it just appears and disappears. I get that because there's no question in my mind that you probably could have a pretty bad feeling or you could have a bad experience in the basement. We just didn't. None of us felt anything. However, that changed in other parts of the house. And that's sort of what Maria was talking about and talking about how it changes for her from moment to moment. Sometimes she goes and feels like she shouldn't be there and other times it feels completely fine. So there was a point at which we'd been in the house a little while now and I was worried about my son. I wanted to go check on him and see how he was doing out in the car. So I went to go see him and he was doing fine, but he had to go to the bathroom and I felt bad for him. You weren't going to take him upstairs. I was not going to take him into the Sally house. And the hotel was, you know, Atchison's not a huge town. It's only a five minute drive to get back to the hotel. That's one of the delightful things about it. Yeah. Yeah. I went inside and I said, hey guys, look, my son needs to use the restroom. I'm going to run him back to the hotel so he can do that. And I'm going to grab our DR60, our digital recorder, so that I can bring him back and maybe we can try and get a few EVPs. Now I'm still not having, I haven't had any strange feelings yet, although Maria talked a little bit about what happened and you're going to get more of a preview on that. But at this particular point, I hadn't been upstairs, but I did think that getting the DR60 would be a good idea. After all, I was kind of enamored with it because we hadn't had it that long. And after, like I said, what better opportunity to yes, use it? What yeah. you, you, you're, you've been using it in your living room to toy around with. Yeah, and we I didn't get with much it. of anything. Well, the night that it, it came from eBay, I think I made some recordings in the living room. Yeah. yeah. And I had a few drinks and it was, you know, embarrassing. <laughs> Turns well, out there are people now that have since listened to those recordings besides me. Who thinks there's something in there. Yeah. And I'm not ready to find out what people heard in my living room. However... The thing I will say is that I had come to realize that Maria was going to let us stay there a lot longer than I thought we were going to be able to stay. So I was like, this makes sense. We should go do this. She's not going to mind. Because the other thing is I didn't want to put her out. She's going out of her way to let us in there and give us a tour so that we can see it on everyone's on a tight schedule, especially on this particular day. And initially, I think there was a part of me that didn't bring the recorder because I didn't want to be presumptuous about how much she was going to let us do in the house and how much time she was willing to spend there. Yeah. But now it was clear to me that she was going to let us stay a little while longer and it made sense. And my son having to go to the bathroom is a perfect excuse to go get it. So I took him back to the hotel. I went and got the DR60 and then I came back to the house and my son again stayed in the car with my phone. I told him, you know, we're going to be done soon, rest assured. And I went inside with the recorder. And as I remember, I came upstairs and I've reviewed the video footage that Forrest has. And it's not completely clear when I left. I'm not on tape saying that I'm leaving, but I do remember when I came back, I think Megan or somebody was like, I didn't even realize you had gone. Maria had taken them upstairs. Several folks were upstairs in the master bedroom, which is the room that Tony had one of his most frightening experiences in. 
And that's the room, the furniture levitated, and then he saw this crazy woman appeared out of the dust and pointed at him, and then a crow appeared on her, or a black bird appeared on her arm, and she said, I'm gonna. That story was crazy. Mm. So that's something that he was experiencing in there, and Deborah was just across the hall, essentially, a few feet down in the nursery with their son, Taylor. That room, again, and there's a closet in there, a walk-in closet in there that has its own window that a lot of people have experienced a lot of things in. And that's the closet that Maria talks about a doll hanging up by her, its hair in. She was like, not in a weird, scary way. And I'm like, but it's hanging by its hair. <laughs> well, just, yeah, yeah I mean, it seems pretty weird to me. But yeah, anyway. Not in a threatening, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, not she to, was yeah. like, it didn't scare her. Raggedy I'm Ann the, doll. clearly the skittish one out of everybody. Yeah, so. of course. There's been a lot of weird things that have happened in that particular closet. And then the master bedroom. When you take a picture from the what is now the front of the house, people have seen figures in that window in some of those photos. So folks were in there. And then for whatever reason, I, was, I feel like I was drawn. I was disinterested in the master mm -hmm. that day. And I was drawn back to the two rooms on the other side of the house, the back side of the house. Those two rooms were the nursery and the other spare bedroom up there. Mm -hmm. And when I went into the spare back bedroom, I had a really oppressive feeling on my chest. The, ch the feeling that I was talking about, that was the first room that I had it in. Is this the first time you actually felt something in the yes. house? Yes, okay. it was the first time I felt anything. And it was a little bit of a wake-up call. Because up until that moment, I was thinking there wasn't a whole lot to the house. When that hit you, that feeling, did you immediately go to that space of like, whoa, there is something here, or something is different about this place? This is not indigestion. This is a heavy, weird feeling. That's a really great question. And I appreciate you asking me because I would say there was a woe to it, but it, it didn't feel oppressive or dark, or evil. It hmm. just felt unnatural. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Just not physically natural. It wasn't just, it was an unusual place for me to feel pressure on my chest, yeah. although it was similar to the pressure I felt at the Kent stage in that particular part of the basement, but it was much, much stronger. Hmm. And that's what I want to make clear. Whatever it was that was responsible for it, it had more power. Here's the other thing. Megan was with me. Megan, who we talked about at the top of the show. And we were in that back room and I said something to her about it. And she, at that point said, no, I felt something too. And she goes, but I didn't want to say anything because I have a heart condition. And frequently I feel something strange in my chest and I didn't want to predispose anybody, right. which I thought was interesting. But here's the thing that was in that room. We then made our way out of that room. There's no furniture in there. In that room at the time, we didn't know any real stories about it. I can sense to tell you Frequently, there are things photographed in the back window of that room that faces the backyard as recently as a few days ago. And that picture is on our website, and I used it for social media for this particular episode, where you can clearly see a dude standing in that room when Maria hadn't been there to unlock it yet for the people who were wanting to go inside. So the house was empty, and there was a man standing in the window of that very room that Megan and I first had that feeling in. Additionally, that is the room that if you listen to the last episode and you listen to the Pikmin interview, which is uh, in the middle of the last episode, that's the room that Tony saw, for lack of a better word, a type of doppelganger of Deborah go up the stairs as though she had just come out of the shower with wet hair up the stairs and disappear into that room. So that room is definitely some kind of nexus for activity. Magna and I came out of that room, though, and I felt drawn to the nursery. And I feel like the reason I felt drawn to the nursery was because I had seen the Paranormal Witness or some more modern show on the house and what the Pickmans had been through. I had not talked to them yet, so I didn't know all the details. But I knew that at some point there were stuffed animals that had been put on the floor in a circle in there, and it had happened in some absurdly short amount of time with no noise, which Tony and Deborah confirmed when we talked to them for the last episode. So you could say that I was, as you said, front-loaded for the nursery. And when I went into the nursery, that feeling came back. And I did not feel it in the hall. I felt it in the back bedroom that we just mentioned, and I felt it in that room, and Megan felt it as well. And you're going to hear her talk about that in her interview about her experience right now. I walked into the nursery, and that's the one with the twin-size bed and the toys, like the kids' toys all over the floor. As soon as I crossed the threshold into that room, I felt like pressure on my chest. I didn't really pay much attention to it because that's not super awkward for me because I have a heart condition and I just climbed a flight of stairs. Well, two flights of stairs because we came up from the basement and then went upstairs. 
So I, I didn't really think anything of it. I was just like, oh, oh, my chest. And so I sat down on the twin size bed and then everybody was wandering in and out of all the rooms. And I decided not to mention anything about my chest because I didn't know if it was my heart or if it was something else. But I did notice that every time I walked out of the room, it went away. And every time I walked back in, it came back. I think I was in there when you and Tess came in and you had the digital recorder, which I forget the name of. And so you were asking questions. I I think we were both sitting on the twin bed and Tess was sitting on the floor and you closed the door because I think it was your parents and Maria were in the room next to us and then we're making a lot of noise. So you closed the door and we're asking questions. And Tess said she thought she heard something, but she wasn't sure. Then we decided that everybody upstairs was too noisy and we weren't going to get anything good. So we kind of uh, left the room and then hustled everybody downstairs, basically, like herded everybody downstairs. And I think while we were doing that, I mentioned that, like, that room felt heavy. Like, every time I went into it, I felt like there was somebody sitting on my chest. After you said the same thing, like you said, like you felt something in the room. And I was like, oh, me too. When I cross into the room, I feel like somebody's sitting on me. So we herded everybody downstairs. And then you went back up with the recorder and did your, hey, I'm going to leave this here for about five minutes, turn it on, set it down, walked out, closed the door and came downstairs. And I think we were all sitting in the, what would have been the dining room, maybe the back end of the house next to the kitchen. And Maria was just telling us like last month we had a picture where this showed up and we heard these EVPs and all of the stuff's on the website, kind of telling stories. And you and Forrest were asking about stuff that you had heard about, like um, the blinds and the pictures with the mirror, I think. So I think you waited five minutes. I think you timed it on your phone, actually. So it was probably exactly five minutes to go upstairs and then grab the recorder. And we all were still sitting downstairs. And what I distinctly remember is you came downstairs and you were standing by the fireplace and you started to play back. It sounded like screeching, basically. And then you ran out of the house. And Tess and I were both like, what the hell just happened? So I think I followed you. And then Tess came behind me maybe a minute or two later. And you had walked to the front of the house. And we were like, hey, what's going on? And you asked us to walk around the back of the house because you didn't want your son to hear the recording. So Tess and I followed you back there and you played it back for us. And like, it was just probably the scariest thing I've ever heard in my life. It kind of just sounded like somebody was about half an inch from a microphone screaming, like inarticulate rage screaming. I don't scare easily. And I wouldn't say that it scared me, but I was like, holy sh- that is weird. So it was like the screaming rage sound. And then maybe like five or 10 seconds of what sounded like mumbling and then screaming again. I think everybody else kind of filtered out. And while you were playing it for Maria and Forrest, I noticed that I had a scratch on my arm right below my elbow on the right side. And I know I didn't do it to myself because I don't have any nails. I couldn't even if I wanted to. So I showed you and you took a picture. And then Tess noticed that she had one in roughly the same spot on the same arm. And I think you took a picture of that one too. And then you said you were never going back in the house. And then Forrest said, well, I'm going to go back upstairs because I think he wanted to do some recording with his thing and with his camera and stuff. It's just to see what he could pick up. So we all kind of hung out in the yard while Forrest was uh, farting around upstairs doing his thing. We walked back to the rental car and like I noticed that the red spot on my arm was fading. So we did more pictures to do timestamps. And we kind of all just hung out out there until I think I went in and got Forrest like 10 or 15 minutes later because we had to go to be at the uh, panel. Like we didn't have time to like hang out much longer because you guys needed to get ready and like get dressed and figure out dinner for your son before we went to do the panel on Amelia Earhart. So up until you played that recording, I was just like, this isn't that spooky. This is just like a weird suburban house with green carpet. And then when you ran outside, I was like, what the hell just happened? Because all I heard was like a screeching noise. And I was like, did somebody hit the car? Like, what's going on? And then I ran outside to see what was going on. And you played that recording for me. And immediately it was just like chills. Honestly, I'd go back. I don't feel like I was in any danger or anything tried to hurt me. Or I don't even know if there was anything there. Because the only feeling I had was that heaviness in my chest. But like I said, I get that all the time because I have a heart condition. Like you guys saying that you felt something too was kind of a little bit of cooperation on that. But like, uh, for me, it's still kind of up in the air. 
that recording is very spooky, but how old is that recorder? And there's just so many variables that I can't say that I would be like unwilling to reenter the house or that I was very scared or anything like that. So that was Megan's experience. You know, we left that part at the end there about her skepticism because we're still who we are and we like to look at all angles for stuff. And it's not just because I had an experience here doesn't mean like, oh, we've, you know, we can, <laughs> all we're going to do is talk about how real it is. Right. For Megan, she made some really good points. The RRDR60 recorder is a controversial EVP recorder yeah. because of its age and the fact that its sample rate is only six kilohertz, which is absurdly low. And it it's, has a lot of problems. It's just for voice memos. It's for it's voice to, memos. to remind you what you need to do at the office, what to get at the grocery store on your way home from that office. And I think the phrase here you're looking for is, we haven't all drank the Kool-Aid, as yeah. the uh, phrase goes nowadays, that we're not all of the same belief and levels of belief or disbelief or skepticism or outright buying into stuff. So... But it's a healthy mix, I think. Yes, it is a healthy mix. And what I love about Megan is that she admits that for her, the recording was poignant and visceral and it made an impression on her. But by the same token, and even with the pressure she felt upstairs in the house, she's ready to go back and do an investigation or, or look into it further. She didn't feel threatened or endangered like I did as a result of the recording. I felt threatened. I can't say I felt in no, I felt danger too. I felt both of those things mm -hmm. and I still feel them when I listen to the recording. So let's get back to where we're at with my particular part of the story. What we're going to do is get to the events leading up to where we made the recording. And we're going to hear from Tess with a, a 15 minute interview with her and her experience. You heard Megan allude to the fact that Tess heard a response to one of the questions we asked when we were doing the first of our two primary sessions in the room. Now I'm back with the recorder, I'm back in the house, and these are the two EVPs that interested me and Forrest the most from the recorder. And the files are numbered on the recorder and they're still on the recorder. And the first seven files were files that I made slightly inebriated in the middle of the <laughs> night in my own living room, the night the recorder came from eBay. Yeah. All seven of them? Or did you spread that over? Uh, two days, maybe. Uh, right. I did some days. one night yeah. and some another night. That's what I remember. You yeah. know, is anything here? No, when I go back and listen to yeah. it, I feel like an idiot. No, so. but the first two, I think I was sitting with you because we oh, just got we, it that yeah, day. Yeah, that's right. And you then, were there uh, in the afternoon. Yeah. And then you went home and then I had some wine and decided to talk to spirits. Which now seems ridiculous because that's not what you want in your own living living room. No, no. But we don't know how this works. Also, uh, we've heard from some of the investigators and people that, you know, I've seen videos of Steve Huff, that he gets them wherever he goes. So it's not a space, is that they may follow you around and it's not all terrible. Sometimes they're kind of protective spirits. Yeah, he has one and he's just walking around in the park. So I guess at this point it occurred to me that we should try and make a recording. And the first idea I had about it wasn't exactly the best because we are amateurs. We're new at this, but we figured we had this if you believe any of this at all, we had a pretty powerful recorder that was capable of getting an EVP. If you're going to get one, I do feel like you're going to get one with a DR60. Now, I've since talked to people with other DR60s. I talked to somebody who we're going to be hearing from in part three of this series who has two, and he has described how he has to set each one of them differently for the most productivity in terms of the sensitivity and others. He said they perform differently in terms mm -hmm. of what they get, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. So for this first significant one, the first one, on the machine following the dumb experimental playful ones I had been doing. What we did was it was me, Forrest, Tess, and Megan all in the nursery. And I had the recorder and I started to ask a question. Megan and I were sitting on the bed. Forrest, if I remember correctly, was standing with the camera and Tess was sitting on the floor, as Megan said, across from her and I on the bed. Yeah. She was playing with the toys on the floor. Right. Arranging them in a circle, uh, just because that's part of the story too. Yeah. 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 And they were kind of already in a circle. Yeah, exactly. They, you know, you'll hear her talk about that in a minute. But I asked the first question which was, if there's anything here that would like to leave a message for us, I think I said anything, I might've said entity, I think I said anything. If there's anything here that would like to leave us a message, please go ahead and do so. At that moment, Tess looked up at all of us and said, did you guys hear that? And I think now would be a good time to hear Tess's interview. We have Tess here, the head of research for Astonishing Legends and the uh, force majeure behind uh, the Astonishing Research Corps. 
She was with us when we were in Atchison for the Amelia Earhart Festival, and she was also with us when we got our impromptu visit at the Sally House, which led to what we're talking about tonight. So, Tess, what I'd like to do is maybe just have you tell our listeners what your recollections are about the events of that day that led us up to the Sally House and the experiences that you had while we were there. I was smart enough or freaked out enough to write down in the hotel, on the hotel stationery, my thoughts and feelings right after the trip. And walking into the house felt completely normal. It started off normal. I thought the house was very 90s, you know, green carpets, red carpets, funny wallpaper. I didn't feel freaked out. And we had um, Maria, who was a fantastic tour guide, and she told some strange stories, but nothing I hadn't heard or seen in the sightings videos, and nothing that really made my skin crawl. The first weird thing that I remember happening was the light to the basement was off, and that was a bit off. Not just <laughs> Marie, off, burned, would not come on, burned out would not or something. Come off. Yeah. And Maria said this was not a joke. This was not a prank she would pull to make it a little spookier. The light legitimately just would not turn on. So we went down to the basement. We saw the stain where the cauldron was, and I didn't. that didn't freak me out. We had all the lights off and very little flashlight light. We did a little spirit box moment, and, and nothing really stuck. And it was just a normal, dirty basement, for lack of a better word. And then she spent another 15 minutes or so telling us more lore, but I felt nothing. I have a hard time talking about it. Like, I've been putting off some of these interviews because I, I don't it makes me feel weird. So yeah. I've been trying to be normal. If I seem weird, feel free to like cut in. It's just, I feel like my throat is like weird. So anyway, I felt completely normal in the basement. It was just a basement. I was a little scared because I'm scared of the dark in general and sleep with the light on, but that's it. More time passes and we wander around the house some more. We hear stories. I chat to Scott's dad and stepmom. And uh, we flip through the visitor book and see everyone that's come down and read some more of their firsthand stories. But again, it's just a normal house. We went to the second floor to explore more. Megan said that she felt something in the room with the most activity that would later, you know, be the room with the EVP. And Scott, I believe you said you felt that too. But Forrest and I didn't feel anything in fact, when we were in the room, I was kind of messing around a little bit and I put the Raggedy Ann doll on the rocking horse because I didn't know we'd be going back to the room and I thought it would freak out whoever visited the house next. So eventually everyone went downstairs and it was just me, Scott, Megan and Forrest getting ready to do an EVP. So this is when the mood started to change. I did not feel the same kind of pressure and sense of dread, I guess, that Scott and Megan felt. But something started feeling off in a room that 25 minutes ago, I was joking around and playing games in. So when we began the EVP session, that's when, oh, sorry, oh, it's really weird. Okay. It's okay. I typed out my notes on my like phone, so I'm trying to like focus on that. Okay. Take your time. Okay. So as soon as we began the recording, my blood literally went cold and I heard someone answer the first question with why. The hair around my ear was moved away very, very slightly, so much so that for a second I thought it was just somehow inexplicably wind. And the only way I can describe the voice, because I almost knew immediately by looking around that no one else had heard the voice, because no one else was reacting the way I was reacting. And I asked the room, I said, did anyone hear that? And the answer was no. And it, to me, seemed that the voice was coming from inside my own head. I don't know how to describe it other than that. It didn't feel like someone was whispering in my ear. And in fact, I wonder if that little breath of, you know, air, that hair pull was someone telling me to pay attention to what was about to come next. Because I feel like you're not used to hearing voices inside your own head that aren't your own. Do you remember the question that I asked? that solicited the the why? I didn't write it down, but I think it was the first question. I know that for sure, because as soon as you turned the recorder on, like as soon as that little red light on, I was like, oh, and literally seconds before we started the EVP. And again, like I was messing around in that room, like getting ready to play a joke on the next people that like came in. 
But as soon as that recording went on and we started, it's like someone poured cold water over my head, except no one else could see it or feel it except me. Um, And everyone else in the room seemed to be doing okay. I think the first question you asked, was it, what are you doing here? What would you like to say? It was more the latter. It was more, um, if there's anyone here that would like to say anything, that's what I said. And that was the answer it gave you. Why? Which is kind of a a strange answer to that question. Yeah. Did you get a sense that it was a little bit like the underlying message was, what's the point? Or did you have any sort of sense of what the why actually meant between the lines? I think, and I, and I think I told this to you and Forrest a couple of weeks ago, is to me, I was so stunned to hear the word why, clear as a bell, that I was very focused on that in the moment. Looking back and judging my own feelings and the end of the recording session, I'd say it was curious. Whatever, it, I don't know if there was malice. I don't know if there was, you know, nice intent. To me, it just felt like why, but maybe why period and not why question mark. Did you have a sense of whether or not it was an adult or a child or male or female? I'd say it would be an adult male. Okay. Definitely not a child. It could have been a woman, but to me, it was just, it was like someone typed the word why and sent it to my head. That's the only way I really know how to describe it because truly I've never experienced anything like that. And I, at first, was not completely aware that no one else had heard it. I thought everyone else also had heard something because, again, to me, it was clear. It wasn't a whisper. It wasn't quiet. It was just why. Did it feel too personal or did it feel like it was flirting with you or like straight conversation? It felt like straight conversation. I didn't feel like it was flirty. And I also didn't feel like it was intrusive in any way, except for the fact that something was in my head that I didn't put there. Okay. So after that, I started feeling ill. I have a note here that Megan asked if I was okay and that I looked uncomfortable or upset in some way. I try to ignore the feelings, the rest, and pay attention and and remain quiet for the rest of the EVP session. But I started feeling nauseous and like there was a lump in my throat. And that lasted throughout the session. I never felt comfortable in a house that for the hour-ish that we walked around, I felt like it was any other house I'd ever been in. And to me, I think that was the scariest thing. Because it's not like we walked into this house and it was immediately oppressive. It was immediately unbearable. It decided to be that way. And that consciousness or that ability to flip a switch to me to this day is what freaks me out the most about that house. Because to me, that says it has some sort of control over who feels what and when it wants to be seen or heard and when it doesn't. So for the rest of the session, I didn't hear anything and I just continued to feel uncomfortable. After the EVP session concluded, you wanted to give the recorder and whatever might be in the room some alone time. And we hadn't heard anything in the room except me and no one else had noted hearing anything or voices or like whispers or anything. So personally, I wasn't expecting to get anything back. The why felt like it couldn't be recorded because again, it wasn't a voice in the way that we think of voices. We walked out of the room. I went back and sat at the dining room table with your parents. We just chatted and I immediately felt better after leaving that room. There was still a lingering kind of like throat tightness and a little bit of unease, but leaving that room made me feel better if not all the way normal. So while we were sitting at the dining room, you rushed into the room and told us to get to the backyard to listen to what you had heard. We played it back and you can hear us leaving. You can hear Scott saying, feel free to say, you know, whatever you'd like. And the door closing, totally normal sound levels. Then as soon as the door closes in the audio, it gets super distorted and something is gutturally screaming. It is the most bone chilling noise I have ever heard to this day. And I was a little kid that grew up Googling EVPs, seriously asked my parents. I knocked on their bedroom door many, many, many nights and said, you know, can I, can I sleep with you? Can I, can I stay with you? Can I keep my light on? Can I watch TV? So it's not like it was just the fact of hearing an EVP. I've heard many from being a child to today. And obviously I heard the one at the Kent stage, but this was something 
different. When we played it back, we all went outside to collect ourselves. There appears to be some words being said in my opinion, but we need editing equipment to sound it out because it's so loud and guttural and almost impossible to listen to. I don't know how anyone's going to listen to this with headphones in. While we were outside, Megan noticed a scratch on her arm. I also noticed a red mark on my own arm, but I'm now just thinking I'd bumped into something and was seeing the red mark and attaching it to a scratch, even though it probably came from something mundane. So I did not really want to go back into the house and I decided to wait outside with Scott, Scott's son, and his parents. While we were waiting, there were two little boys who kept driving their little bikes around the front of the house. The younger of the two seemed very interested and drawn to the house. He kept trying to get into the door, knock on the door, look in the windows, walk down the path, and back up. I found that really odd. Could just be weird kid behavior, though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is your assessment of what you your personal experience was the voice in your ear? Has that changed your perception of things just in general in the world or? Oh, radically. I think if people would be interested in knowing this, and I hope it doesn't ruin any illusions they might have, but I am a skeptic and have been. And I think that shows in you know, the research I've done and pushing back on certain things and trying to find out logical answers for things. And I don't think being a skeptic is a bad thing. I just want to know every angle. And a lot of the times there are angles that are logical and mundane that aren't always explored with gravity with some of these cases. As being, you know, the lead researcher, and it's been three years in September, I've been working with Astonishing Legends. And I think seeing some of the cases, especially our recent ones, like the Black Monk of Pontefract, that there really are things out there that can't be explained. And I've always respected that, but I've never expected anything. I've never really experienced anything strange. And honestly, that kind of makes researching a little easier. Coming back and having to dive back into episodes. And I don't only do episodes. I work on the newsletter and I do blog posts. So I'm diving into usually multiple topics at various levels. And, uh, Researching, it definitely took me a little bit to get back into the groove because I kept looking over my shoulder and also, you know, wondering, well, has anyone ever described hearing something the way I heard that? I think that's one of the biggest things that I've looked into personally because I've been researching for a long time ish (laughs) and I've never ever heard the description of a voice coming from someone's own head in a case we've covered. I've literally been looking since we got back in July Uh for another story that describes what I heard. And I really haven't come across many. I've read about intrusive thoughts and that kind of stuff, but this, it didn't feel like angry or upset. So I've been trying to find like that. Do you think your hair actually moved or just felt like it moved? No, it moved. It moved for sure. That was a real world physical thing that happened. Without a doubt in my mind, if I, you know, was being super, super, super hardline skeptic on myself, I'd say the voice would almost be the thing that I would erase and not the hair. To me, though, they feel completely connected because I think, especially from researching the paranormal, one thing that I've always kept in mind is our expectations of the paranormal. They don't really meet us on our plane that much. Sometimes they need to give us hints. So, you know, The men in black probably don't look like men in black suits, you know, in their forms or whatever. But they appear to us that way because it's authority, because we'll listen to them, because we'll open our door to them. To me, the hair lift seemed like a signal to me to listen. Because especially like I went to an all-girls Catholic school and wore pigtails and Peter Pan collars. And there always be someone whispering in your ear. And I had my hair down, I think but I always have my little sideburns. And so that's what I felt went up, like this part of my hair, uh-huh. ever so slightly. Like someone was going like this, which yep. isn't helpful to podcast listeners, but. No, but I mean, you're describing it very well. And it to me, that felt like a signal because I feel like otherwise I might not have been listening in the same way or expecting the same thing. Have you experienced anything since you got home? Every time I've tried to sit down and talk about this, listeners, you can ask Scott and Forrest. I'm usually a very prompt person. Everything usually comes out on time or right around time. After we got back from Kansas, you and Forrest both asked me to write down my thoughts 
or type them in an email or whatever. I had them written down on my notepad and my notepad sat in my suitcase for months. I would text you and Forrest periodically. Okay, like I'm working on it tonight. You know, as kind of a, I sometimes give you guys my to-do list for the day and then I'll say, oh, and then I'll send this to you. And it never got sent. And that's not like me. Every time I've, you know, gotten updates or spoken about it with you and Forrest and Megan, and right now, to be honest, I feel sick and scared and uncomfortable. And that's not like me at all. I'm pretty tough. I watch a lot of horror movies. So I'm used to things going bump in the night. But this produces something visceral. So have I heard things or seen things or experienced things? No. But every time we talk about this house, I feel like I felt in that room. So as you can see, I was actually surprised at how much this experience affected Tess. She had her own experience. Hers was different from mine. I mean, Mm -hmm. she heard the recording and you heard how she felt about the EVP. But for her, she connected with that house in a different way that none of us did. And it's pretty amazing. In a way, what happened to her is more powerful than what happened to us with, you know, her hair actually moving back and then hearing that. And she's had to try to deal with whether or not that was making her crazy. She kind of got a live EVP. Right. In her head. The other thing that I think is interesting is how she described the nature of what she was interacting with as curious. Whatever it was that said why, she felt like it was curious about the situation. Another part of what she said that I can really relate to, the common ground that she and I have with our two experiences, is the procrastination element. Mm -hmm. When it comes to putting this project together in this particular episode in this series, when she said she was putting things off, I can relate to that because I have been too. I had a lot of interviews to do, and I should have booked them way sooner than I did. I had a hard time reaching out to people, or when it came time to set up the times, I was pushing it as far down as I could closer to the wire, I guess, than I should. And Mm -hmm. that was because I didn't want to talk about it. Doing the interviews was important to getting the show done, but I didn't want to talk about it anymore. So it was a hard thing for me to do them. And so I was putting things off too, which is unusual for me, especially with regard to getting our show done. After the session that we did with Tess and Megan and Forrest in the room, it occurred to me that, especially with that recorder, we got to get everybody out. So there can be no question about the noise and no handling noise. And I will say that I did put the recorder on the table. Those were files eight and nine that we did in the room there. File 10 is the one that has made the biggest impression on me and I think most people that have heard it. In order to remove any doubt about any possible sounds coming up on file 10, I came up with the idea of corralling everybody together, as you've heard in the interviews, sending them downstairs, and then setting up instructions on the recorder, putting the recorder on a table, and leaving the room for five minutes. So I sent everyone downstairs, and I stood in the room, I put the recorder down on the table, and I said, if there's anything here that wants to leave a message, now's the time speaking to this recorder. And I said, I'll be back in five minutes, and I left the room, you can hear me close the door, And I went downstairs and joined everybody else. Now, we were all downstairs in the living room, which is in the opposite corner of the house and all the way around the stairs, a good ways away from the bedroom, which was upstairs with the door closed. And I'd like to add that the house is primarily carpeted. So there's not a lot of sound carrying from downstairs to upstairs. I sat with everybody down there and Maria told some stories, as Megan said, about recent things that had happened in the house, ongoing events. And I watched my watch. Now, Megan said, I think you were probably timing it on your phone. I wasn't because I still didn't have my phone. My son had the phone out in the car, but I had a watch on. So I watched that and I was going to time it for exactly five minutes. So I sat there and kept an eye on the watch while everybody was just talking and I participated in the conversation. And then I realized that it was time to go upstairs. And we even have this on video because Forrest was shooting video. He was standing over with Maria towards the front door on the other side of the living room. And you can hear me in the background say, I'm going to get the recorder. And I walk past the camera and I go up the stairs. 
I then came back down and I was listening to it off camera from where Forrest was videoing, I guess. And I'm trying to find the file and make sure I don't accidentally erase it because these little recorders, it's easy to screw up. So I was being very, very careful. And I played the file back and I held it up to my ear because I was thinking, if you heard the episode that we were talking about, EVPs at the KPW, EVPs at the Kent Paranormal Weekend, there were some recordings there and it wasn't our recorder. We got secondhand kind of not great copies of the files where you could hear something say what sounded like dark roast, which <laughs> related to a particular spirit in the theater that likes dark coffee. And boy, don't you now wish that's all you heard here. Yeah, that's what I was expecting. So coffee talk. I was sitting there holding this thing up to my ear and I had pressed play on it and it starts out and I can hear myself. I'm leaving the room. Be back in five minutes. And then it just started this insane, enraged screaming. And there weren't clear words that I could make out. To me, it sounded like a roar. You know what I'm saying? Like there, there's Call humans, it what you want. There's but... human screaming. This was an angry, guttural roar of some kind that was not animal-like. It was more humanoid, but not fully human, I'll say. Yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah. I can't even classify it that far because my brain shuts down when I hear it. And I found it pretty upsetting. And at that moment, as Megan said, I ran out of the house. I didn't really run, but I, it was a very brisk walk. No, and when you watch the video, it's uh, all we hear from Scott is, I'm done. I'm done. That's it. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm and done. you can see me walk behind Forrest and take off out of the house. And yeah, I believe that's what's called a beeline out of the house. I did make a beeline out of the house. And as I got outside, I then realized that I was standing on the front porch in direct line of sight with my son, who was in the car, and of course, looking at me probably trying to figure out when we were going to leave. And I realized that I didn't want to scare him. So I took the recorder. I mean, I had the did recorder you, with Did me. you wave or what'd you do? You just... No, I just, I tried to gather myself and act like I was just walking around to the backyard. And I went around the side of the house to the backyard where I was later joined by you guys and I, and I played the recording for you. That's how that happened. I do want to add that with regard to what the recording sounded like, I did play it for Tony Pickman, and this was his reaction to that. It sounds so much like what I was hearing in the bedroom. It was just like, it was several. I could never make out one individual or exactly what it was saying. So once again, we got something here that Tony recognizes, and it's something that he could relate to because it's like what he heard during those events that took place in the master bedroom that time. I can't even imagine what that experience was like for him, because for him, that wasn't just audible. That was audible, visual. It was every one of his senses was being assaulted. But the other thing that's crazy about that is that that was nearly 30 years ago. If it's the same thing, that thing's been there a long time, and it's still doing the same stuff, and it clearly took an interest in sending a message to me that day. The thing about this place is a lot of people have done investigations there and there are a lot of EVPs. Like we said, the Pickman family has gigabytes and gigabytes of EVPs. Professor Sean Daly, who we'll be talking to in the next episode of the series, has done over 50 investigations in this house. He has a ton of EVPs too, and we've been given access to a good portion of a lot of those from everybody, and we'll be sharing those with everyone in the next episode, and they're different from the one you're going to hear from us. There are some that sound just like a person speaking plain as day that's in the room with the other folks in the room, but the other folks in the room will tell you there was nobody there. It's like there's this voice that's clearly saying something. All right, so I'm into this thing now where I've realized that my perception is different, and that's something that I explained up at the top of the show. I've gone from trying to prove to myself that something like this thing that's on this recording can exist to accepting that it does exist. and. That has changed my entire outlook on pretty much everything that I experience, both within and without the paranormal world. I believe that it's real, yeah. and I don't care if anyone else believes what I believe. I'm not doing this episode because I want to convince anyone that ghosts are real or that what happened to me is real. I know what my personal experience was, and I know that it's changed how I perceive things, and that's enough for me. And I get that because you also don't need to be giving it any more power. In a sense. Yeah. And, and, I, I, and I don't mean you know, psychic astral power. I mean, maybe in a, in a way, yes, but it's emotional, mental power. It's emotional health for you. No, in, in dealing with it, and I, I would say that it has been therapeutic 
doing this episode. I do feel good, good. It's been difficult living with this since July, to be honest. I'm sure, yeah. Putting it on a shelf so we could save it for Halloween has probably been the dumbest decision I've ever made in my life. <laughs> no. Because I, yeah. no, because I would rather have come back mm -hmm. and done the show and moved on from this. But instead, I go to bed thinking about it. I've been dreaming about the Sally House. I've been thinking about the experience. I'm talking to everybody under the sun about all the horrible things that have happened to them there. And now I'm talking about what happened to me and it's been three months and I'm ready for Christmas. <laughs> all right. So right. it's time to play this recording. I'm sorry we've kept you in suspense too long. We're going to play this file for you that we got at the Sally House on July 21st of 2018. Now we're dark after this until the weekend of November 9th when we're going to come back and talk about not only our own EVP, but the preponderance of evidence present with other EVPs and photos that we have at our disposal now. We're going to be sharing all that stuff with you. The other thing we did was we packed up our treasured RRDR60 recorder and shipped it to one of the top forensic audiologists in the country to have him analyze the recordings and tell us what he thought they were or how they were created. And the results of what his lab found are going to surprise you. Now here's what's even weirder. Another person with a DR60 recorder like ours sent that recorder to the same forensic audiologist just a few days before ours. And he had made a strange recording in Florida the day after we made ours in Kansas. And that story is really kind of crazy. So we're going to be talking to him. We're going to be talking about that other recorder. And yes, this was the first time that this particular company had received any DR60s from anyone. And the two, ours and this other one from Florida, came in about five days apart. And that story is just gets weirder and weirder as you start to look into the details. So we're going to play this file for you now here at the end of the show. I want to reiterate, this was taken directly from the DR60 digital recorder using a custom-made cable by an engineer friend of ours that allowed us to run a line from the mono headphone jack on the player directly into a patch bay in a professional mixing booth so that it could be brought in as cleanly as possible into Pro Tools. We've made no changes to the audio presented here of any kind except for one. The volume of the EVP, which is a kind of screaming that we got, is pretty far from the setup volume when I was talking to whatever thing might be in that room. Those were pretty far apart. So we asked a friend of ours who's a professional mixer, and it's the same guy that does all of our opening announcements, John Bolin, to mix the levels to a more suitable range so that you would be able to easily hear my setup and then the EVP itself without having to adjust your volume. At this point, I want to make one final and very sincere warning. This is your opportunity to skip this last part of the show if you don't want to hear the EVP. And I say that because I guess given the opportunity for me to skip it and erase it from my mind, I would take that because once you hear it, you can't unhear it. And a lot of people are going to say, oh, you blew this out of proportion. Big deal. I don't even know what the big deal is. And that's fine. If you want to say that, great. It's up to your own belief system. I personally, for me, it doesn't matter to me what other people think. I just know how I feel when I hear it and what it means to me. And I'm not looking for validation. And I want to be abundantly clear about that. So if you're a parent and you're listening with young kids, you may want to listen to it first and make sure it's something that they're okay with. And if you're somebody who has a hard time with enraged screaming or yelling, or what you might perceive as that, I would think twice about listening to it, too. And now here's the audio from File 10, recorded in the nursery of the Sally House in Atchison, Kansas, on July 21st, 2018. The room was empty for five minutes and captured nearly two minutes of something unknown in voice activation mode. Okay, File 10, I'm putting this down. I'm going to leave this here for about five minutes. If there's anything you want to say, any message you would like to share with the world, leave it on this recorder, and we will share it. Leaving now, closing the door. No one else is in this room at this time.
that's going to wrap up tonight's episode of Astonishing Legends. We're taking a little time off and returning with part three of this series the weekend of November 9th. You might think this story is over, but it's not. We'd like to issue a special thank you to John Boland for doing the custom show opens we've had this month, as well as Anna Boland for her performance. We'd also like to thank the Atchison Chamber of Commerce, especially Jackie Prejean and Maria Miller. Please remember to support our sponsors. They keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Our show is edited by Sarah Wendell, and our theme, which is available as a ringtone, is by Judson Crane. Sound design is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to The Ark and its lead researcher, Tess Feifel. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also find us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends if you'd like to support the show in that way. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. Thank you.